Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, today we're going to hear some expert evidence on the provision of water uh, for firefighting purposes. Yes, Mr. Kinnick. Sir, so may I call hmm. Dr. Ivan Stoyanov? Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Dr. Stoyanov. I gather you're going to take the oath, is that right? That's right. There should be a testament there. Would you take it in your right hand, please, and read the words on the screen? Thank you. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Now, Thank please you. sit down and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. All right. Yes, Mr. Kinesh. Thanks, sir. Uh, would you please confirm your name for the record? Yes, my full name is Ivan Yurdanov Stoyanov. Good morning, Dr. Stoyanov. Uh, thank you very much for attending to give evidence this morning. It's much appreciated. Now, my questions are intended to be uh, short and simple. Sometimes it doesn't play out that way. If they are in any way unclear, please say so, and I'll rephrase them. Uh, secondly, if at any stage during the giving of your evidence you require a break, please say so, that's not a problem. And thirdly, could you please uh, remember that the stenographer is trying to capture everything you say and everything you say accurately. So if you could uh, uh, go at her pace, that would be much appreciated. And also, uh, please, where you mean to indicate yes or no, say yes or no, rather than nod or shake your head, as yes. the case may be. Now, You've provided two reports uh, to the inquiry. Uh, your report entitled The Provision and Use of Water for, firefighting the fire, for Fighting the Fire at Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017, uh, dated the 20th of July 2021, can be found at ISTRP quadruple zero treble zero one. Is that your report? That's correct. Yes. And you provided a supplementary report dated the 29th of March 2022, uh, which can be found at ISTRPS quadruple zero treble zero one. Yes, correct. And that's your supplemental report. Yes. Uh, can you confirm that the facts and matters set out in those two reports are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, I confirm so. And is it correct that you've provided the reports in the same way that you would have provided an expert report to a court? Yes, correct. And do your report set out your opinions on the matters that are relevant to this inquiry? Yes, correct. Now, if we can go to ISTRP quadruple zero treble zero one forward slash six, uh, we see here at section 1.2 uh, you set out uh, your expertise. And if I could briefly just go through some of those matters. Um, first of all, uh, you hold a diploma, a Bachelor of Engineering and an MSc in Civil Engineering from the Faculty of Hydrotechnics at the University of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy in Sofia, Bulgaria. And those degrees were awarded in 1995, is that right? That's correct. And <coughs> in 1998, uh, you were awarded an MSc in Environmental Engineering by the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine here in London. Is that right? Correct. And in 2003, uh, you were awarded a PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering by Imperial College. Is that also right? Correct. Uh, can you help us? What was the subject of your doctoral research? Uh, my work was very much focused on um, a phenomenon in water supply networks known as pressure transients. So uh, the, the work was uh, uh, based on uh, mathematical modeling of this phenomena and also an extensive experimental work. And part of that work was uh, in collaboration with Thames Water at the time. Thank you. Uh, is it right that you are currently a reader in water systems engineering at Imperial? and you hold a five-year fellowship in water systems engineering from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Correct. Now, if we uh, look at the bottom of page six at line 28, uh, you say that uh, your expertise uh, covers four things, and I quote, first, the design, operation, and control of water distribution systems. Two, applied and fundamental research in the hydraulic modeling pressure control and optimization methods for water distribution networks, three, pressure transients analysis in water distribution networks, and turning over the page, four, experimental research 
in water distribution networks that combines laboratory experiments and field studies in complex networks. Is that a fair summary of your expertise? Yes, it is. You also lead a research group at Imperial called InfraSense Labs, so that's I-N-F-R-A-S-E-N-S-E -S -E Labs, which you founded in 2009, which focuses on the design, optimization, and control of water supply networks. Is that right? That's right. Uh, am I right that you have no expertise in relation to firefighting, emergency planning, or instant response? Correct. Thank you. Now, if we could uh, go to uh, ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero one forward slash five. We see midway down the page at line 13, section 1.1.2, uh, where we find the heading My Instructions. There you describe the questions which you were asked to address in your report, and I'll uh, read them into the record so that they are uh, known to everyone. One, how much water did the London Fire Brigade, LFB, use during the Grenfell Tower fire, both internally and externally, including A, the type of equipment available, the flow rate needed for optimal operation of each piece of equipment, and the difficulties encountered in achieving the necessary flow rate, B, the number of water jets, C, their time of use, D, the duration of use, Two, what were the locations of fire hydrants from which LFB supplied water for firefighting their flow rate? Excuse me. Discharge characteristics and conditions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Were there alternative water sources that might have been utilized by LFB? Three, based on evidence gathered in the context of questions one and two, and using simulations created using that evidence, what was the water flow and pressure in Thames Water, TWUL's water supply network, uh, on the night of the 14th of June 2017, was operational pressure consistent with the minimum pressure requirements? Four, what was the response of TWUL and was it effective? Is that a complete summary of your instructions? Yes, it is. Your supplementary report addresses two particular matters. Um, first, your understanding of a meaning of a British standards document referred to in your main report, and secondly, the conclusions of an LFB report testing some of its equipment. In broad terms, is that right? That's right. Now, it's clear from these instructions, and it will become clear throughout your evidence, that your report inevitably touches upon actions taken by and decisions made by the LFB on the 14th of June 2017. Is it right that while your report comments and draws conclusions about the brigade's actions from a water or hydraulic perspective, you do not seek to draw conclusions on matters of operational firefighting or strategy as these are outside your expertise and so outside the scope of your instructions? Th that is correct. I, I made observations, uh, but uh, as, you, as you pointed out, these observations are by no means conclusions on, on the necessary actions for firefighting. Could we go to ISTRP quadruple zero, trouble zero two, forward slash five, and line 24? You see there, you say this, <coughs> where relevant to my instructions, investigation, conclusions, I've commented on the actions and statements of a number of individuals, including LFB firefighters and officers, network service technicians and other TWUL employees. None of this analysis is intended, nor should it be taken, as personal criticism of the individuals concerned. I have no doubt that they acted to the best of their ability in extremely difficult circumstances on 14th of June 2017. Uh, am I right in understanding that's a point you particularly wish to emphasize before starting your evidence? That, that's correct. Um, could we... Uh, stay uh, on this page, and uh, we see in section 2.2 at the foot, uh, you summarize there the various materials that you relied upon um, for the purposes of producing your report. Um, I won't uh, go through everything, um, but is it right to say that the materials identified in section 2.2, which starts at page 5 and goes over to page 6, um, is the accurate summary of the evidence you've considered in reaching the conclusions set out in your report? Yes, it is. Now those preliminaries are dealt with, uh, Dr. Stoanov, can I turn to deal with some basics 
um, that we probably need to establish before we turn to more of the detail. And the first element of the basics I'd like to discuss with you today is the water distribution network itself. Yes. Now, um, if we can go to ISTRP quadruple zero triple zero three forward slash five. Now, uh, in this chapter, in broad terms, you describe the water distribution network and its functions. Now, in summary, is the water distribution system a complex network of pipes and valves used to transport water from storage, such as reservoirs and water towers, to customers and hydrants, either by force of gravity and or with the assistance of pumps? Yes, it is. It is a complex system. <laughs> and the emphasis on the word complex. Correct. And system as well. Um, secondly, the water distribution network's purpose is to provide water in an appropriate quantity at the appropriate pressure and of the appropriate quality with mineral water leakage. Is that, again, a fair summary of its purpose? Uh, we, yes, absolutely, with a slight correction at minimum cost. Clearly, leakage is part of these components of wastage we are trying to minimise, but generally the provision of these key variables needs to be done at minimum cost. And finally, your report refers variously uh, to the water distribution network, to the water distribution system, and to the water supply system. Uh, am I right in understanding those to be interchangeable terms, meaning the same thing? Um, not, not entirely, because um, we, we have a certain hierarchical structure within these systems. Uh, these systems include the bulk uh, transmission of water, for example, from reservoirs to treatment works to uh, a certain kind of service reservoirs. We call this water transmission network. Uh, we then, from the water transmission networks, the, the pipes go into the streets to, to deliver water to individual customers. So this is what we refer generally as water distribution. And then we have the supply pipes which go to the, to the individual customers. So water supply system is the overarching term which combines both the transmission and the distribution. Thank you. Now, if we can stay in this chapter of your report, but go to page eight. And we see at the top of that page, figure three dash two, and in broad terms, uh, this uh, illustrates how water is delivered from the water distribution system to a fire brigade uh, during a fire. In broad terms, is that a correct summary? Yes, it is. Now, if we can first identify the various components of this diagram, the blue uh, symbol to the left is a water tank or reservoir, i.e. the water source. Is that right? Correct. And the water source could also be a pumping station. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the blue lines represent the water pipes or mains, is that right? That's right. The black symbol with a red dot at its centre is a fire hydrant. Correct. Uh, we can see the red pumping appliance, which people would ordinarily know as the fire engine, is that right? That's right. And to the top right, uh, we can see a building, a building with a uh, dry rising main through which water is made available for internal firefighting. Is that right? That's right. And finally, we can see in the bottom right uh, a firefighter holding a handheld firefighting jet, uh, which is known as a branch. Is that right? Correct. Now, again, this is uh, an example, and you might instead have depicted, for example, an aerial appliance or a ground monitor, which we'll come on to discuss later in your evidence. Absolutely. The purpose of this diagram schematic was very, very broad, just to highlight that different uh, uh, appliances and, uh, as you said, branches can be fed by, from the pump appliance. Thank you. Now, in simple terms, and apologies if, if this is too simplistic, uh, water travels from the source through the system of pipes to a hydrant. The fire brigade can then use hoses to supply water from the hydrant to their pumping appliance from which the water can then be pumped on through further hoses to firefighting equipment. Is that a fair summary? Correct. Now, you describe the water distribution network at Grenfell in Chapter 6 of your principal report. Um, for that purpose, could we go to ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero eight forward slash eight and look at line 17? Now, there you say this. <coughs> 
Grenfell Tower is located within the Barrow Hill Zone, which is part of the London Water Resources Zone, operated by Thames Water Utilities Limited, TWUL. TWUL is the statutory water undertaker for a large geographic region, which inclo includes the whole of central and greater London. Uh, first of all, does that remain a correct summary? That's right. Now, if we can stay in this chapter, but go to page 10, uh, we can see there in the top part of that page, uh, you list five sources of water which can supply water to the Barrow Hill zone in which the tower was found. We have the Barrow Hill Reservoir, the Wilsdon Reservoir, the Hammersmith Pumping Station, the Holland Park Shaft, and the Barrow Hill Shaft. Now, is it right that the two reservoirs supply water by gravity? In other words, they store water at a higher altitude than the buildings and customers they supply, so there is no pumping arrangement required? Uh, yes, uh, the, the setup is a little bit more complex, and I have another figure which explains this. The, the way this setup operates is uh, in that particular system is uh, water is pumped from uh, our pumping stations in uh, Hammersmith. Uh, from there, it supplies water during the day, uh, both in terms of a very wa large set of water transmission mains and, and distribution mains, and during periods of low demands, the reservoir balances that supply and demand. So uh, it could be that sometimes it's pumped water, so it's pressurized. It could be that at night time, when the pumps are turned off, then the actual water from the reservoirs is fed by gravity into the same distribution networks. So there is this notion of flow reversals across this water transmission mains, depend on balancing to get that supply and demand. Apologies again, I may be making matters too crudely simple, but in essence, uh, the Hammersmith pumping station, the Holland Park shaft, and the Barrow Hill shaft supply water by pumping it uh, from the Thames water ring main. Is that essentially correct? Uh, yes, and, and again, a slight sort of distinction here. I know these are small technical details probably, but uh, the actual Hammersmith pumping station can feed water from the London ring main, but equally directly through a set of transmission mains from uh, the pumping station in the west of London. Now, could I turn on to the three key factors for the provision of water for firefighting? And to that end, could we go to ISTRP quadruple zero Trouble zero three forward slash seventeen. And we can see at uh, section three point one point four, uh, you say that from a hydraulic perspective, there are three key factors which affect the provision of water for firefighting. Is it right that you include the qualification from a hydraulic perspective? because there may well be other factors outside your knowledge and expertise which are relevant uh, for a fire service uh, from an operational perspective. Correct. Uh, whereas here you focus strictly on the physical requirements for the supply of water, is that right? That's right, yes. There, there are other factors which, as you, as you highlighted, is beyond the hydraulic control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, the first key factor you identify for this purpose is at point one and it is the available quantity of water. Put bluntly, the amount of water that is stored in tanks or elevated reservoirs within the water distribution network accessible through hydrants. Again, essentially, is that correct? That's right. Now, you've mentioned water from tanks and reservoirs here, um, but presumably that would also include water available from pumping stations. That, that's right. I mean, it's, uh, it's a complex system of all these storage uh, facilities, such as uh, reservoirs, uh, service reservoirs, etc. But equally, they're, they're supplied by uh, pumping stations, treatment works, etc. So it's part of this large, complex system. And again, at its simplest, in relation to the water distribution system at Grenfell, this would include water available from all the sources we've been discussing, Barrow Hill and Wilson Reservoirs, Hammersmith Pumping Station, and the Holland Park and Barrow Hill shafts. Is that right? That's right. And is it right that the available quantity of water is fundamental? Because in plain terms, if there's not enough water available, that diminishes the adequacy of firefighting? 
efforts. That's right. It's one of the components is the availability. Clearly, as we see, there is uh, other components later, probably in the discussion. But yeah, availability is number one. But when we're talking about quantity available here, are we really looking at the total volume of water in the system? It's, um, so, so generally, we um, we try to um, satisfy particular physical laws. And this physical loss for us is the conservation of mass. So I need to have a certain volume of water which I need to use. The que second question is, can I use it at the right time, at the right place? But as far as the storage is concerned, that system had uh, um, infinitely larger storage than it was required for firefighting. Well, that's rather what I had in mind. But um, all right, well, you've explained that. Thank you very much. Now, the second key factor that you identify there at point two on page 17 is the water flow rate delivered from fire hydrants to pump appliances. Now, in layman's terms, uh, when we talk about flow rate from a hydrant, uh, we're referring to how much and how quickly that hydrant can supply water to the pump appliance. Is that right? Correct. And if we stay uh, uh, on page 17, uh, you highlight three particular things um, to which, on which the flow rate from a hydrant to a pump appliance depends. And we can see little a starting at line 17 there. Um, first of all, the water pressure in the pipe which supplies the hydrant. Can you help us? What is the difference between water flow rate and water pressure? Uh, well, these are fundamentally different uh, variables. Um, so pressure, in our case, this is the force which the water would apply on the pipe wall. Uh, and uh, that force we, we generally um, we define as, 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 as water pressure. We can express water pressure in different terms in different units. Uh, flow rate will be the, the volume of water going across a section over a certain period of time. So if I, uh, in a very simplistic term, if I open a, a, pre uh, a, a tap at home to have a shower, the flow rate will be, let's say, 100 liters per minute or so. Uh, and, and that is the, the kind of the volumetric flow going over a particular time over that particular cross-section. So these are two fundamentally different variables. Well, presumably you can have a high pressure and a very low flow rate as when you puncture a garden hose. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, let, let me explain with this bottle, for example. If I squeeze this bottle, I will increase the pressure into the bottle. If I have a very tiny hole into that bottle, I will get a very little flow rate, yeah. irrespective of how much I squeeze this. So the actual flow discharge, whether it's through a fire hydrant, whether it's through a branch, whether it's through a leak, they are all governed by the same physical phenomenon, which is the discharge through an orifice. And that discharge through an orifice depends on the characteristic, the discharge characteristics of that orifice and the differential pressure. So in other words, if I'm discharging to the atmosphere, that will depend at the pressure at the inlet to that nozzle or, or pipe or, or fire hydrant, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm relieved the top was on your bottle as you demonstrated. Yeah, no, I, I made sure that that's the case. <laughs> um, the, the higher the water pressure in the pipe serving the hydrant, um, the higher the flow rate from the hydrant. Is that too simple, or is it, for present purposes, correct? Um, it is correct. Uh, the second uh, point you identify, point 2B, line 19, is the flow coefficient of the hydrant. We will return to flow coefficients in detail later on. But in layman's terms, is it right to say that a hydrant's flow coefficient is a measure of how great a flow rate the hydrant can provide, given the pressure of water it receives? Correct. This is very much as uh, I just mentioned about this fundamental principles of flow discharge through an orifice. It depends on the characteristics of this orifice, which in this case will be expressed by the flow coefficient and, uh, and the differential pressure across that orifice. And the, again, just as a flow from that point for a better phrase, the flow coefficient is important because if a hydrant has a very low uh, flow coefficient, then even if it is provided with good water pressure, it will provide a low water rate. In essence, is that right? That is correct. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the flow uh, discharge across an orifice, uh, we would have this kind of a um, flow coefficient multiplied by the square root of this differential pressure or the pressure. That means that in very simple mathematical terms, if I increase the pressure twice, 
that would be the square root of this number two, which would be, sorry, gives me 40% increase in the flow rate across that orifice. So consequently, the flow coefficient is a very key part for me to reach the final objective, reaching particular discharge across that hydrant or, or branch or whatever. Thank you. And the third point we see at point C at line 21 is that the energy or pressure losses between the hydrant and the pump appliance. And pressure losses can be caused, for example, by kinked hoses due to increased fr friction. Is that right? Correct. I mean, the other phenomenon, as, as I earlier stated, you know, water, is, uh, water in a conduit or a flow in a conduit will be governed by certain physical laws, and part of it is this kind of a notion of uh, pressure loss or uh, pressure head loss. Uh, that, that is due to a lot to, to do with the conditions of the pipe and the conduit. Uh, there will be a lot to do with a certain additional uh, turbulence that might be occurring. So in the example we just highlighted is, for example, kink hoses or even hoses with a lot of uh, uh, um, a larger length with a lot of interconnections, couplings, that can introduce additional uh, head loss into that particular system. Thank you. And if we could stay in this chapter, but go to page 20. At the top of the page at section 3.2.5, um, you explain the concept of continuity of flow. Um, in lay terms, the flow rate delivered from the hydrant to the pump appliance is important, because if it is not high enough to maintain continuity of flow, the pump's tank will gradually empty which means that the water supply to firefighting equipment will be paused whilst waiting for the tank to refill. Again, is that a fair summary? Yes, I mean, water is not compressible. So as a result of that, uh, whatever we get into that tank, that's the same volume we'll, we'll be able to get out of that tank. And, and the actual pump appliance has a storage tank, which is not very large, it's only about uh, roughly 1.4 cubic meters of water, so it's about 1,400 liters uh, storage capacity. Uh, and you have to balance whatever comes into that tank needs to be equal or greater to whatever comes out of that tank, which goes through this centrifugal pump mm -hmm. installed on the pump appliance. Thank you. If we can go back to page 17, and we see at line 25 the third key factor that uh, you identify um, which is the provision of water for firefighting is the flow and rate, sorry, is the flow rate and pressure at the branch, nozzle, monitor, air appliance or dry rising main. Uh, again, in simple terms, that means uh, the flow rate and pressure at the end piece of the firefighting equipment. In other words, whatever it is that actually projects the jet of water, is that right? Th that's right. And the higher the pressure and the higher the flow rate of the water going into a piece of equipment, the higher the volume and or distance of water it can project. Again, in its basics, is that right? It is. I mean, the water jet, ultimately, we need to, we need to kind of transform certain kinetic energy into that water jet. And that kinetic energy will be a function of the mass, the volumetric mass over certain confined volume, and equally the velocity of that flow rate. So that's why any, any forms of branch or a nozzle has this optimal operational uh, specifications. Uh, and this operational specification takes this trade-off between safety, safe operation of that nozzle, and equally maximizing flow rate and reach of that nozzle, of the, of the jet projected from that nozzle. Thank you. I now want to turn to the second part um, of the examination today, which is water deployment on the 14th of June 2017. Now, this uh, subject is addressed in Chapter 5 of your report, uh, where you set out a detailed chronology of the deployment of water jets at Grenfell Tower from the first arrival of uh, LFB crews at 0059 to approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Is that right? That's right. Now, if we can go to ISTRP quadruple zero, treble zero six, forward slash three. Now, uh, here you explain uh, that your report identifies, first of all, paragraph 1A, the equipment used and available to LFB to project uh, those jets. Secondly, at paragraph 1B, the timing and duration of their use, along with their estimated vertical reach. Thirdly, at paragraph 1C, the location and status of the hydrants and pump appliances used to supply the water. 
D, at paragraph 2, the utilisation of the equipment in relation to their rated water pressure and flow rate. Now, looking at paragraph 2, uh, you say here from the end of the second line this, rated water flow rate or rated pressure is the maximum flow rate or pressure for which a branch, a monitor nozzle, and the complete water supply setup, a pump appliance, fire hoses, fittings, and a branch or a monitor can be safely operated. Is that correct? That's right. So put in layman's terms, each piece of equipment will have a pressure rating and a flow rating which describe the maximum water pressure and the maximum flow rate for which the equipment can be safely used. Is that right in its essentials? It is right, because that balances the, the notion of the effective, maximum effectiveness of the use of that equipment and its safe operation. Where do the rated pressure and flow figures come from? What's the source of that information? So generally, that the source of that information uh, is based on the manufacturer's specifications. Uh, ultimately, the manufacturer is their obligation to be able to uh, identify through testing and validation uh, the balance of these trade-offs. And, and, and probably there will be some safety factors. So in other words, uh, these figures might not fully represent the, the actual capabilities of this equipment because they, they need to allocate for some unsafe potential use of that equipment and that safety factors take into account that particular conditions. Is it right that the rated flow and pressure figures are also sometimes referred to as the nominal or optimal flow or pressure figures? That's the general uh, use in, in the engineering language and, uh, and, and kind of uh, applications, but I have not been able to identify that into the LFB documents. Now, in your report, you calculate the utilisation rate of firefighting equipment by comparing the flow rate that the equipment received on the night with its rated flow figure. Is that right? Correct. So uh, I strongly believe in this sort of notion of cumulative gains. So in other words, if you want to, the, the final outcome, which is to project a water jet at its maximum reach and its maximum flow rate, because that will be the best chance to offset particular heat release rate, that means that that equipment needs to be operated as close as possible to the specified rated values. So just giving a practical example in layman's terms of the point you've made, if a particular piece of firefighting equipment brush had a rated flow of, say, 1,000 litres uh, per minute, but received an actual flow rate of 500 litres per minute, you would describe that handheld branch as being 50% utilised or as having received 50% of its rated flow. Is that a practical example of what you're, the point you're making? It is, because that will have ultimately the impact on the reach which that water jets can, uh, can, can reach. And equally, uh, it will have an impact on uh, the ability to uh, stop certain heat flux occurring on a, on a particular ignited surface. Now, if we can go back to the page on the screen, which is page 3, and we see at line 22, paragraph 3, uh, you there identified difficulties encountered in supplying water for firefighting from the water distribution network. And finally, at paragraph 4, um, you deal with alternative water supply sources that might have been uh, used by the LFB. Um, is that a fair summary of the structure of Chapter 5? Um, that, that's right. So in Chapter 5, I try to uh, systematically look at the utilization of water jets as a first instance. So we, I had access to a <coughs> number of uh, visual we, sources. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We'll come on to that. But Apologize. I'm really yes. inviting you just to confirm that was the structure. I confirm, yes. Okay. And if we can go to um, ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero six forward slash four, which over the page. Uh, the report uh, states, and I think this is the point you were coming on to, um, the evidence presented in this chapter has been gathered from sources including witness statements, video footage provided by the National Police Air Service, video footage from body-worn cameras provided by the Metropolitan Police Service, and other sources as referenced in the report. Is that a fair summary of the materials you've relied upon? 
Correct, and that material provides very high granularity in terms of time on the utilization of the water. Now, you refer to other sources in addition to those listed here. Uh, those other sources include documents, disclosure from the LFB, and from manufacturers relating to firefighting equipment. Is that right? Correct. And you also refer to evidence given by firefighters during phase one of this inquiry. Is that right? Correct. And is it right that there are also some limited instances where you've uh, relied upon photographs of the tower taken by members of the public or press uh, on the day of the fire uh, during and which have been uh, published online? Correct. Now, taking those sources together with those listed at the top of uh, page four of chapter five, does that represent a comprehensive summary of all the sources you've reviewed for these purposes? It does. Now, if we can go uh, to stay in this chapter, but go to page seven, uh, we can see starting at line 16 onwards, uh, you list the external jets, which you've labeled jets A through to J, which were deployed by the LFB on the 14th of June from the first arrival of the brigade until about one o'clock in the afternoon. Is that right? That's correct. Now, what I'll do, Dr. Stonoff, I'll go through each of these jets uh, with you. Okay. Um, first of all, Jet A, which was a handheld branch on the east side of the tower, which was first projected at 0115 hours. Now, a handheld branch is simply one, what one might describe as a handheld firefighting hose. Is that right? That's right. Now, we can see an example in your report of uh, handheld branches used. Um, before we look at that, um, I should say that uh, there is a trigger warning for people in the room and who are watching. We're about to see some still images which show the fire on the exterior of the tower. So anybody who feels uncomfortable about that should take steps to leave the room or the live stream now or otherwise protect themselves. I will wait a few moments to allow people to do that if needed. So if we can go to figure 5-17 on page uh, 27 of this chapter, which is page 37 with the opus reference, uh, we can see in figure C there is a green oval uh, symbol at the bottom right of that, and that is a photograph of a handheld branch being held by two firefighters. Is that right? Correct. And this is what you refer to as Jet A. Correct. Uh, if we can turn over the page to page uh, 38, we find figure 519, uh, the second set of images on that page. And here we see uh, three types of handheld branch used by the brigade. Is that right? Correct. Uh, the video and any evidence I've, uh, I have come across very much indicates the first two branches. I have not seen uh, any any evidence that uh, the third one, Delta Attack 400S Pro, has been used. Thank you. Now, if we could go back to page seven and the list of jets you helpfully provided. Uh, we see at little b at line 17, Jet B, which you describe as the uh, Alpha 213 turntable ladder east, was utilized continuously between 0147 hours and 0205 hours with about 60% of its rated water flow of 2,000 litres per minute. Now, am I right in understanding that this was the first of the three aerial appliances deployed by the LFB at Grenfell? Uh, correct. Again, we need to be careful uh, by stating three because uh, the second aerial appliance, A245, actually was never deployed as a, uh, the monitor of that aerial appliance was not deployed. There was a high pressure hose uh, stuck to that particular appliance. So, so just to, just for the kind of be very accurate with that statement, I would say out of the probably two deployed aerial ladder platforms. Okay. Now, Again, just dealing with basics, aerial appliances are fire engines with a ladder or a cage which is capable of being extended. Is that right? Correct. Now, you noted here that Alpha 213 received only approximately 60% of its rated flow. Uh, we'll come on to that later, but I just want to sort of put a place marker for that particular point here now. Next, Jet C, which you describe as a ground monitor on Grenfell Walk, which you note is to the south and east of the tower 
which was used uh, intermittently between 0 to 41 hours, 11.30 hours. Uh, now, just looking at basics for these purposes at the moment, Dr. Stoyanov, a ground monitor is a water nozzle which sits in a frame, enabling it to be placed on the ground and aimed in a particular direction without the need for firefighters to hold it uh, as if they were holding a normal uh, firefighting branch. Is that an accurate description? Correct. And we can see an illustration of a ground monitor to remind people, uh, which is at page 21 in this chapter at figure 5.6. Thank you. And that's what we're referring to here. Yes, and just for clarity, that ground monitor can be used with different nozzles, and that sort of figure also indicates the use of these different no nozzles. One of them is the mercury adjustable flow nozzle, and the other one is the plain deluge tip, or what we refer normally as a smooth bore Thank you. nozzle. Um, could we go back to page seven? And if we could look at uh, little d, which is at line 22, you identify jet D, D for delta, and you describe it thus, alpha 245 aerial ladder platform on the east side of the tower was utilized for less than one minute at 0 to 13 hours, and then continuously between 0 328 hours and 0 945 hours, with a pause between 0 657 hours and 0 714 hours, uh, aerial ladder platform or ALP245, uh, was, I think, the second of the three aerial appliances deployed. And if you could bear with me in saying there were three deployed, just for the sake of clarity and establishing <laughs> basics first before going into detail. Is that right? Uh, correct. Now, at the bottom of page 7, uh, paragraph 1E says this, Jet E, which was Sierra 13 Alpha 1, the Surrey aerial ladder platform on the east side of the tower, was utilized after 10.47 hours. Now, Jet E is, I think, another aerial appliance uh, which you refer to as the Surrey aerial appliance. Is that right? Correct. And if we turn over the page to page eight, uh, line three, we have jets, as in the plural, F, multiple handheld branches for extinguishing burning debris on the east side, utilized intermittently. And here again, apologies for asking you about what may be the obvious, but burning debris refers to ignited material that was falling from the tower to the ground. Is that right? That's right. And so these jets were aimed not at the tower as such, but at burning debris on the ground surrounding the tower. Is that right? Correct. Uh, we have next Jet G, a handheld branch for burning debris on the south side. We then have, uh, going down at the page to line 11, Jet H, a covering water jet from a handheld branch initially, which was later, sometime after 0, 05 hours, 100 hours, replaced with a ground monitor, northwest corner. The water jet was projected intermittently between approximately 0, 0243 hours and 1052 hours. Uh, can you help us here? What do you mean by a, water, uh, by a covering water jet? Um, so uh, that, that's a water jet which was projected from the ground monitor onto the tower. Um, and that specific one, it's uh, uh, the water jets on the northwest corner. And next, Jet I, uh, which is dealt with at line 15, a covering water jet from a handheld branch, west side. The water jet uh, was projected intermittently between about 0245 hours and 0345 hours, is that right? Correct. And finally, Jet J, a covering water jet from a handheld branch, west side again. The water jet was projected intermittently between 0, 0320 hours and 1052 hours. Is that all the jets that you've identified for the purpose of the report? Correct. And, uh, and just to say, I, I believe I have high confidence into that list based on the very high granularity of the, of the visual data which uh, uh, was provided to me. Now, these 10 jets, A through to J, uh, describe all of the external water jets deployed at Grenfell from the start of the fire until about one in the afternoon. Is that right? Correct. And just going back to basics so we know what we're dealing with in this chapter, this chapter also describes the supply of water to the dry rising main, as we can see at page eight, 
point K, uh, a hose you refer to as supply K, which was also used to supply water to the inside of the tower. Is it right, though, that the focus of your analysis is water jets deployed to the exterior of the tower? Uh, correct. Um, so supply K, I, I think we have to, uh, this was particular emphasis was the north and west sides of Grenfell Tower. Uh, clearly, the supply of the dry riser main was done uh, through the south side, where the actual uh, breaching valve was placed. Uh, so that's not explicitly mentioned into this list. Thank you. Now, each of the jets deployed at Grenfell, uh, whether a handheld branch, a grand monitor, or aerial appliance, was supplied by a pump appliance. Is that right? Correct. Now, we don't need to go to them, um, but at pages 10 through to 11 of this chapter, you identify the six pump appliances which were used uh, to uh, supply the jets deployed, and they were pumps Golf 271, Golf 272, Alpha 241, Sierra 13, uh, Police 1, Hotel 421, and Alpha 431. Is that a fair summary? That's right. Yeah. And those pump appliances were, in turn, supplied with water from a total of four hydrants. Is that, first of all, let's deal with the basics. Is that right? Yes, it is. Now, if we can uh, stay in this chapter, but go to page six. And if the map could be expanded. Uh, that is a uh, map of the area immediately surrounding uh, Grenfell Tower and the tower itself is the bright green box labelled GT. Is that right? Correct. The four larger circles highlighted in yellow show the four hydrants used to supply water on the night. Is that right? Correct. And if we can take these in turn, first of all, H1 is a fire hydrant located to the southeast of the tower under Grenfell Walk. Is that right? Correct. H3 is a fire hydrant located on the intersection of Grenfell and Bowmore Roads. Is that right? That's right. H8 is a fire hydrant located on Bramley Road. Is that right? That's right. And hydrant WOH5, seen here to the right of the tower, is located next to the Kensington Leisure Centre. Is that right? That's right. It's between the Kensington Leisure Centre and uh, the Aldrich Academy. And just so people understand, the letters WO are important here. We'll discuss their importance later. But WO stands for washout. Is that right? That's right. And finally, this figure also shows, with the smaller red and blue circles, other fire hydrants in red and washout hydrants, which are in blue, situated in the vicinity of Grenfell Tower, but which were not used on the night. Is that right? That's right. Now, uh, just going one, apologize, one extra thing here yes. I just wanted to emphasize is the private hydrant, which is uh, in close proximity to H1. That private hydrant was labeled the most appropriate hydrant in the ORD uh, uh, for the predetermined attendance specification. Thank you. We'll come on to these matters in due course. Can we first, though, before we come on to those other topics, low flow rates? And I'd like to turn in particular to your conclusions about that topic uh, and the flow rates delivered to aerial appliances and ground monitors on the 14th of June. Now, if we can go to page in this chapter, but go to page 236. At point two, you conclude as follows. Of the three aerial appliances and two ground monitors which projected water jets onto Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017, none were supplied with their rated water flow rate. And if we uh, uh, go on further between pages 236 and 238, you would go on to describe the specific details of each aerial appliance and ground monitor's rated flow figure compared with the the flow rates which you estimate that they received uh, on the night. Uh, we don't need to go through all of that detail which is set out on the next three pages, but can I summarise that content and see whether you agree with the summary or not? First of all, Alpha 213 received about 60% of its rated flow. Is that right? Correct. Alpha 245 
received between 16 and 20% of its rated flow. Is that right? That's right. Thirdly, Sierra 13 Alpha 1 received between 12 and 19% of its, flow, of its rated flow. Correct, but for Sierra 13A1, we should also bear in mind that the actual um, monitor has a minimum flow rate, and that minimum flow rate was not reached. So although I can provide a value of uh, whatever percentage was delivered, we should bear in mind that the actual flow rate was below the operational minimum threshold for that particular appliance. The grand monitor on the south and east sides received between 63 and 86 percent of its rated flow. Is that right? Correct. And the grand monitor deployed from the northwest corner received between 21 and 37 percent of its rated flow. Correct. Again, another thing probably I might be jumping here a little bit is about the timeliness of this. Uh, if if yes. we can just deal with this. what I'm trying to do, first of all, is establish basics so there's a clear That's uh, figure in people's mind. And then if we can get into some of the detail later on where it's necessary and relevant. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to deal with next is how you calculated the flow rate figures. <laughs> now, first of all, the mathematical model was provided by Thames Water which you then validated with practical testing carried out in 2018 and with data available from the night of the fire to ensure that it could accurately predict the flow and pressure conditions in the network at different times and locations during the fire. That, in turn, allowed you to estimate the flow rates delivered to the various pieces of firefighting equipment. Now, that's high level, but is that, in its essence, a correct summary of the approach you took? It is, and I just want to add to that that clearly these mathematical models, as we call them hydraulic models, we have very high confidence into these models. These are not just some abstract, highly uncertain. We, have common, we commonly use them in a number of incident management, and it's commonly used by the, by the UK war industry as a whole. Uh, Modelling has its critics. Yes. Can you briefly, I emphasise the word, briefly describe why you think the results are reliable, or at least tolerably reliable? Uh, because in terms of the actual model, I have taken a, a, a very robust approach towards the validation through use a lot of experimental work. Uh, uh, so I have very high confidence in the model, in the hydraulic model, and equally through the testing of the flow coefficients of the hydrants, I have now very good understanding about their discharge characteristics. And in combination with understanding of the pressure and flow within the network and the flow coefficients of the hydrants, I can, I can derive very re pretty accurate estimates of the flow rates coming out of these hydrants. Now, can I turn on to the next topic, which is the consequences of low flow rates? Sure. Now, your report describes three consequences of low flow rates uh, delivered to the aerial appliances and the ground monitors. And I just want to identify them at the start, Dr. Stoinoff, and then we'll come to deal with the detail uh, in due course. First of all, they limited the vertical reach of the jets projected onto the tower. Is that right? Correct. Secondly, the low flow rates caused interruptions to the jets. Is that right? Correct. So the jets were not consistent. Thirdly, the low flow rates meant that some equipment could not be deployed as intended. Is that correct? Correct. Can I deal with the first one of those consequences, which is limited vertical reach? Yes. Now, as uh, you've confirmed, the low flow rates limited the vertical reach of jets. Now, before we go any further, again dealing with basics, vertical reach simply refers to the maximum height uh, reached by the projected water jet, is that right? Correct. Your analysis identified that the three aerial appliances deployed at Grenfell Tower, I use that phrase advisedly, but for the sake of clarity, which were able to reach higher than any other jets, achieved maximum vertical reach of approximately 35 metres, which is the 13th floor, 47 metres, the 17th floor, and 52 metres, the 19th floor, respectively. Is that right? Uh, that was on the night of the fire, yes, as used. Now, if we can go to page 238 and look at paragraph 3, uh, you conclude this. Alpha 213, turntable ladder. Alpha 245, 
aerial ladder platform and Sierra 13 Alpha 1 aerial ladder platform were capable of projecting water jets to the full height of the tower, which was 65.4 metres, if supplied with their rated flow and nozzle pressure from the pump appliances. Now, if we turn back to page 52 in this chapter, we find at figure uh, 5-29 an annotated graph. And this graph is provided uh, by the manufacturer of one of the aerial appliances, I think Alpha 213, and you've added the writing in blue. Are those points correct? They are. Now, we don't need to go through the graph in detail, but I'd like to look in particular at your blue markings and comments on the graph. Yes. Now, you note that uh, the graph shows that when provided with the correct flow rate of 2,000 litres per minute, uh, this appliance can project water to a maximum height of 35 metres from the nozzle and adding that the maximum height of 30 metres at which the nozzle can be positioned using the appliance's cage, that comes to a total of approximately 65 metres. And that is the basis for your conclusion that this particular aerial appliance, Alpha 213, had a maximum possible vertical reach of 65 metres, which you note is uh, to the top or thereabouts of Grenfell Tower. Is that a fair summary of your conclusion annotated there. Correct. Now, Grenfell Tower is 65.4 metres high, slightly more than 65 metres. Is it right, put differently and in lay terms, that the maximum vertical reach of Alpha 213 is there or thereabouts the total height of the tower? Correct. Uh, ju just to add to that clearly is that um, the manufacturer provides what they call the effective reach Clearly, and that effective reach is based on specific, um, again, specific consideration about safety and et cetera. That, that's an orifice discharge. So if, uh, if we can actually provide 10 and a half, 11 bars, even a very small deviation on that particular uh, um, appliance or that particular uh, monitor, that can even reach a little bit higher. The other thing is that that water jet will be affected by environmental conditions. We know that on the night of the fire, the wind was very low. We have the information from the weather stations. So to, as far as the environmental conditions go, uh, my, my assumption is, my hypothesis is that they had very little impact. So in summary, yes, uh, 65 meters is my estimate, but um, that sort of a 40 centimetres you're referring to here, it's, it's certainly probably within the, the maximum reach, not the effective reach. The effective reach is normally about 10% of the maximum reach. And just picking up the variables that are in play here, uh, that achieving the maximum possible height depends not just on uh, supplying the appliance with the rated flow rate, um, but also on the jet itself being projected at the optimal angle, is that right? That's correct, yes. And, and equally, um, I'm sure we'll touch later, but the actual experimental results which shall be provided very much substantiate these results. And just looking at this graph, what we see is the tallest blue line, or rather I think this is what it shows, is for a jet aimed at a 30 degree angle. But if the jet is pitched at a shallower angle, for example, 40 degrees, the green line on this graph, the maximum height reached by the jet falls at least to the, a, to the lay eye, quite significantly. Is that right? Correct. Okay, can we just make sure we've understood this correctly? Um, <coughs> the angle of attack is the angle at which you are directing the jet, is that right? Correct. And <coughs> it looks to me as though the blue line uh, is an angle of attack at 75 degrees, is that right? Well, it depends how we measure the angle, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I think uh, you're absolutely right. The angle of attack here on the blue line will be 75 degrees. Uh, so, so you've got to point it uh, as high as possible correct. to get that uh, extent of jet reach in a vertical plane. That, that's right, but uh, when you look at uh, just very basic trigonometry here, in terms of angle, distance, where the actual aerial appliance was positioned, I don't think that was uh, an obstacle to project that water jet at that particular angle. 
Well, that, that, you may well be right. I, I, I just wanted to ensure that we'd understood the colours yes. correctly. But since I've now broken into Mr Kinnear's line of questioning, I might ask one further question. Um, the horizontal reach shown on the graph... Yes. What is that telling us? That, so, clearly, um, that, that shows us what is the, the furthest away reach which a jet can can outreach. So if, if let's say, this, this monitor is deployed in a situation where uh, potentially the objective is to, uh, to outreach a fire on an on a industrial estate or, or whatever, you probably want to be at a safe distance but have that outreach in terms of horizontal distance and consider that horizontal distance. So that's the variations between the, uh, the angle of projection and also the reach and the trajectory of that water jet. And um, is, is this graph telling us that in order to project a jet uh, 35, let's say, metres above the nozzle, yes. you've got to be only 20 metres uh, horizontally from the point at which you want that to be achieved? Is it telling us that? Not no no this this is oh. no so it uh, so if if you want to project it as uh, so that's what I'm saying it's a very basic trigonometry so if you take a, a triangle and I want to project that and I have the angle and I have the distance I can very much sort of the the calculation is that in that particular case it's probably about eight to nine meters distance uh, in answer to your question I can achieve from the object where I want to project it I'll be able to achieve that 70 well let me ask my question in a slightly more um, practical way how close to the building would you need to be in order to project a jet 35 meters from the top of the ladder about eight meters but oh. equally if you bear in mind that the way a213 was positioned it was positioned very close to the building but equally the projection was not done in that direction most of the time the projection was done along the building yeah. so in other words we didn't have that exact constraint uh, the, the actual ladder could have been even pulled a little bit more along the east side, and again the projection could reach to the top of the right. building without these constraints. And equally, A245 in terms of distance was the ideal distance to, to achieve that projection. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Mr. Clear. Just flowing from uh, the, the chairman's questioning, can we go to LFB00123672? Uh, as we can see on the screen, this is a report prepared by the LFB dated the 12th of November 2021 entitled Flow Tests Conducted on Aerial Appliances Types Used at Grenfell Tower Fire. And if we go to page two of this document, we see in the third paragraph, uh, the report says this. The flow tests summarized within this report were designed to assess the operational capability and performance of LFB equipment within the optimal working parameters as provided within the Dr. Stoenoff report to ascertain whether the calculated provision of water could be achieved in an optimized working environment with equipment in service at the time of the Grenfell Tower fire. Now, in simple terms, the report seeks to test whether your theoretical estimates uh, for the maximum vertical reach of the aerial appliances could be achieved in practice. Uh, was that your understanding of the overall point of the LFB's tests? Uh, correct. Now, if we can go uh, to the final paragraph uh, of this introduction on page two, which is immediately above the emboldened heading, turntable, ladder, and monitor, uh, it explains that the testing was carried out on the 25th of August and the 6th of September, 2021, and looking at the middle of the second line of that paragraph, and I quote, all of the equipment assessed as part of the performance tests was produced by the same manufacturer and of the same model as that which attended the Grenfell Tower fire on the 14th of June, 2017. And we can see from the bottom of page two that the LFB tested a turntable ladder. And if we go over to page three, Uh, what's described there is an aerial lift platform, uh, sometimes always described as an aerial ladder platform as well, and an Akron Mercury quick attack monitor, uh, otherwise known as a ground monitor. Is that right? Correct. 
Uh, the only thing I would like to add to this is that yes. all of this equipment is described. Uh, the, the report does not explicitly specify the serial numbers of the monitors and the nozzles used into these tests. And why is that important? Um, well, generally, we can even further validate with the manufacturer whether these specific serial numbers and uh, uh, have gone through the kind of testing mm -hmm. which the manufacturer provides, and that gives us additional reassurance. It also, it's important for us to really cross-reference that the tests which LFB have done, which uh, I think implicitly uh, uh, the statement is, the assumption is that these are exactly the same equipment, or very similar equipment, the similar branches is used on uh, during the Grenfell Tower fire. I would have liked to see the serial numbers of the equipment used on the Grenfell Tower fire and the serial numbers and exact models of the equipment of branches and nozzles used into these particular tests. Thank you. Now, can we go to page 16, which sets out the results of the tests under the heading conclusion, uh, roughly a third of the way down that page. Um, it sets out that the maximum jet height that was achieved for each piece of equipment tested, which for the aerial appliances were 49, 60, and 62.3 metres respectively, uh, the report then concludes in the paragraph below in the following terms. For all of the flow tests undertaken within optimised practical working conditions, the maximum throw of water achieved using equipment available at the time of the Grenfell Tower incident, it was not possible to exceed 62.3 metres in vertical water throw. Now, put... Uh, differently, the LFB concludes that the LFB aerial appliances theoretical maximum vertical reach figures uh, were not achievable in practice and that those aerial appliances were not capable of reaching the top of the tower. Now, before we turn to your response, uh, was that your understanding of the LFB uh, conclusions in this report? That's very much my understanding of what LFB concluded, yes. Now, you address the LFB's testing in page... 21 of your supplementary report, which we can find at ISTRPS quadruple zero trouble zero one forward slash 21. And we can see at paragraph 47, which is in the bottom third of that page, uh, you conclude thus. Uh, Say for performance test 3B, which we don't need to go into for present purposes, I do not agree that the LFB test results above are representative of the maximum achievable vertical reach of a projected water jet for the equipment tested. In relation to performance tests 1, 2 and 3A, the LFB did not supply the tested monitors' nozzles with their rated inlet pressure and or flow rate. Consequently, the vertical reach of projected water jets observed by LFB in those performance tests is lower than the maximum achievable vertical reach of the tested monitor's uh, nozzles. Now, you say at the beginning of that paragraph, say for performance 3B, just so people know, that was one of the LFB's tests of the ground monitor. Is that right? That's right. And just to note, the ground monitor here has achieved 41.2 metres vertical reach, which is actually exceeds my est conservative estimates of about 35 metres. And you've excluded uh, performance test 3B from your conclusion because that is the only test which you say did actually supply the correct pressure and flow rate. Correct. Yes. Now, if we can put that grand monitor uh, test to one side, is it right that you do not accept the LFB's conclusions in relation to the aerial appliances because the appliances, and I put this in lay terms, weren't supplied with the correct water pressure and flow rate that would have allowed them to achieve their maximum jet height? That's correct, and this to me was very surprising given the fact that LFB had my recommendations in place. Now, could we um, stay in this report but go um, to page 22? Uh, we can see, and we don't need to go through it in detail now, but at pages from 22 through to 25, you set out your detailed analysis about why uh, the correct pressure and flow wasn't provided um, to the aerial appliances. Uh, can you help the panel in brief 
What is your essential conclusion on that point? Why the correct pressure and flow wasn't provided to the ALPs? Well, as you said, the most critical variables here is the nozzle inlet pressure and the flow rate for which these uh, uh, monitors and nozzles need to be provided. And this nozzle inlet pressure will depend on the pump discharge pressure and also the pressure head losses across uh, the connections, the, the hoses, the, uh, the different connections uh, for these hoses. So consequently, if one does not have the right set of hoses, which we would expect LFB to, to take this into a place, and uh, uh, it, there's no way they can provide the actual the nozzle inlet pressure required to perform this test, which achieves that rated nozzle inlet pressure. The other thing, uh, my view is that uh, we do a lot of experimental research, and experimental research is extremely critical to be able to go in a systematic way to validate your measurement equipment, make sure that specific measurement is put in place. And, and to my view, LFB uh, did not follow even basic standards in performing experimental tests. For example, uh, one very simple approach would have been, as I highlighted in my response, is to just measure the nozzle inlet pressure at that particular point, and that would have given us a lot of confidence in the repeatability and analysis of these tests, and that was not done. So to put it simply, is it your view that, uh, to put this rather crudely, I suppose, LFB used the wrong nozzles? Uh, no, they, uh, I, that's not the case. They used the right nozzles because the nozzle is the actual part of the monitor. But yeah. what they did is they didn't supply the nozzle inlet pressure, which I specified in my recommendation, which is part of this rated nozzle inlet pressure. So the, in other words, the pressure at the inlet to that nozzle was significantly lower. And I'll, I'll, I've kind of justified right. that, that they should have provided for, for the purpose of these tests. So they used the right nozzle, but without the maximum input pressure? Correct, to that nozzle. I see. So uh, to me, I, I wasn't... I can't say whether this is, it's, it's really puzzling from my perspective whether that was lack of basic knowledge in pipe hydraulics or, or there were other factors in place. Thank you. And for that reason, the contents of the LFB's testing does not cause you to doubt or qualify or amend the conclusions you reached? Not at all. Even if I look at the ground monitor, if you go back to uh, the LFB results and if you look at the specifically the ground monitor, the ground monitor with the mercury uh, uh, mercury nozzle, even though it doesn't get the nozzle inlet pressure, has a much higher performance than the actual performance test 1A, which is coming from the LAP. And, and broadly, they have very similar nozzles. And that sort of very clearly indicates to me, uh, again, reaffirms my hypothesis that simply they didn't provide the correct nozzle inlet pressure. Um, just to give people a bite-sized summary, okay. you don't agree because the LFB testing failed to account for various pressure losses due to friction and gravity, which occurred between the pump and the appliance, where the LFB monitored the pressure and flow rate and the nozzle of the aero appliance being tested. Correct. And to me, that has a big impact on any policies LFB can drive from these tests. Secondly, the LFB didn't use state-of-the-art equipment to monitor pressure or flow, and instead relied on physically looking at mechanical gauges and manual recording. Correct. Thirdly, the testing was carried out using a single fire hydrant as a water source with a flow rate of 2,000 litres per minute, which was less than the required flow rate of 2,400 litres per minute. Is that right? Correct. Uh, I don't want to take this too crudely or simplistically, but those are the three principal reasons uh, why you uh, are not persuaded <coughs> by the results the LFB gathered as a result of their testing. That's right. Can we look at matters slightly differently from a different perspective now and look at the, uh, the issues that arise out of your own estimates of the jet's vertical reach? I'd like really to discuss and identify the limitations of your own estimates. Uh, sure. Now, first of all, your estimates are just that. They're estimates um, based on desktop calculations uh, which have not been replicated in the practical real-life situations. Is that a fair point to, to make? It is a fair point. Secondly, there could be other factors which are not included in your calculations and which uh, may lie outside your expertise, but which may affect an aerial appliance's achievable vertical reach. Again, is that a fair generic observation? 
I, I, I would like to know what, uh, how you describe these other factors. So, well, should we go through? To be able to, to agree. Well, well, let's go through them because there are some of the ones you identified earlier in your evidence. Um, first of all, weather conditions. Correct, but again, as as stated, uh, uh, we cross I cross reference the weather conditions from the meteorological office stations, and uh, e equally that was done by other experts such as Professor Luke Bisbee on uh, and the impact on the weather conditions and wind on let's say the fire spread. And their conclusions is that was minimum, and equally the same conclusion I can draw for the the projection of the water jet. Dr. Stonov, could I ask you to take matters? more slowly. Okay. Um, stenographers finding it difficult just to keep up. Thank you. Another factor uh, which may need to be put into the balance here is the performance of the appliance itself, which may have declined uh, to some extent uh, since factory conditions due to continuing use. Is that a, a legitimate point uh, to bear in mind as well? Um, so, so one, so we have several factors here. Clearly, we have the pump discharge pressure. And I specifically asked for all maintenance records for the centrifugal pumps to be made available to me. And these maintenance records indicate that the performance of these pumps were well within the expected specifications of these pumps. So any other equipment that might deteriorate somehow is the actual nozzle geometry or, or some of the components of the nozzle, but, but again, I would find that difficult to believe. So, so my, my assumption is that actually this, this equipment should have performed to its operational specification. But perhaps as your answer indicates, performance of the appliance and the various uh, supplemental bits of equipment are a is a legitimate factor to bear in mind when considering maximum vertical reach. It is. Yeah. Um, there may also be uh, operational firefighting reasons um, which factor into decisions about the use, placement, or projection angle of an aerial appliance at a firefighting instance. Give a practical example, um, burning debris falling off a building and having to avoid that. Uh, correct. That's, uh, I, I fully agree, but equally we see the example of uh, uh, Alpha 245, uh, which uh, clearly... Um, was at a distance to the building. We don't necessarily have to go to it, but um, the LFB report noted that water at the highest peak of the maximum jet height fell very sharply downwards and created a significantly wider, more dispersed cone of water with reduced energy. Uh, that, in the report author's professional judgment as a firefighter, would have significantly reduced effect on firefighting operations uh, due to the dispersed nature of water at that height. That is a legitimate consideration to bear in mind. Would you accept that proposition? Yes, I would. However, again, it's, uh, it's uh, probably that will go beyond the scope of my, uh, of my investigation, but it seems that we do have evidence to suggest that even small amounts of water can very effectively deal with the heat flux on these specific ACM panels. Uh, so that is the end of my questions on the first consequence of low flow rate, which is probably a reasonable place to stop if I think it is, yes. Well, Dr. Stoneoff, we have a break during the morning in any event, and this is a good time to take it. So we'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at 25 to 12. And I have to ask you while you're out of the room not to discuss your evidence or anything relating to it with anyone else. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you go with the usher, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. 25 to 12. Thanks, sir. Please.
Uh, would you ask Dr. Stoyanov to come back in, please? Thank you. All right, ready to carry on? Hi. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. Thank just, uh, Mr. Kinnear, before we continue, may I just revisit your question uh, before the break uh, with regards to the uncertainties associated? Yes. Um, I, I would just, uh, I, again, on reflection, I mean, absolutely, uh, I think all these uncertainties you've identified, they are, they are rightfully, they should be raised. But this is, again, the reason why this experimental validation is supposed to address these uncertainties and bring better clarification. Uh, and, and in the examples with, let's say, Thames Water, we run these experiments jointly. We, we had a, an agreed protocol of how to run the experiments on collecting hydraulic data from the network uh, on the basis of which we can have the discussion. With, unfortunately, with LFB, we did not have that interactions in terms of running the test and agreeing on processes, procedures, and measurements. So in, in the end of the day, it's very difficult for me to use these validation results to, to really address some of the uncertainties you mentioned. Please, please don't worry, Dr. Stonoff. You've made your, your point very clear, and you've re-emphasized it now. Thank you. So can I now turn to the second consequence of the low flow rates you identified in your report, and that was, in broad terms, interruption to jets. And if we can go to ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero six forward slash two three six. Uh, this sets out some of your conclusions from chapter five of your report. And if we could look at the end of line 10 in paragraph two, you say this. The insufficient flow rates into the onboard tanks of pump appliances also resulted in frequently stopping the operation of the onboard centrifugal pumps to allow the tanks of the supplying pump appliances to be refilled. Managing the water deficit between the inlet flow rate into an onboard water tank of a pump appliance and the outlet flow for a projected water jet resulted in continuous variations in the jet's flow and reach. Now, earlier we discussed the concept of continuity of flow, and that is what was essentially lacking here. In broad terms, is that the point in a nutshell? Yes. Less water was going into some pump appliance tanks than was being pumped out of them to firefighting equipment, so the tanks would repeatedly empty, the jets had to be stopped to allow refilling, and then to start up again, and that's the essence of the problem. Correct. And um, I, I, I believe we, we have very good uh, cross-reference of this by firefighters on the night in their witness statements. Now, in some cases, jets could be deployed for less than a minute uh, before the pump tank ran out, requiring the jet to be paused for 20 seconds or so before the tank refilled and the jet could be restarted. Is that right? Correct. Uh, one partial solution which firefighters were able to improvise uh, to prevent these interruptions was to turn down the pump settings so that less water was pumped out to the firefighting equipment to match the limited flow of water coming into the tank. Um, it's right that that's what was attempted on the night, wasn't it? That's right. And we can look very closely at the pump characteristics to see that behavior. At the moment you start reducing the flow rate, you're reducing the pump discharge pressure, and that has an impact on the nozzle inlet pressure. I, and that's the, that's the big downside to that particular approach, isn't it? Because in order to ensure continuous or nor, near continuous supply of water, you'd have a much weaker diminished jet of water. Correct. And this is very much, uh, uh, these are variable speed pumps. The pump appliances have very powerful variable speed pumps, and that's the relationship between pressure, pump discharge pressure and flow rate is very well represented there. <coughs> Can we now turn to the third consequence of low flow rate that you identified, which was, in essence, that some equipment could not be deployed? Now, uh, as you identified in earlier evidence, and I said we'd come on to, uh, the, there were problems with Alpha 245, an aerial appliance, in that the water flow rate it received was insufficient, effectively, to project a jet of water from its higher capacity nozzle. In a nutshell, is that right? Correct. And again, to use a horticultural analogy, 
It's a bit like a large garden hose uh, receiving only a small stream of water uh, such that the water dr dribbles out and isn't projected any distance from the hose. I agree, although I would like to use a more scientific explanation, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> In essence, that's the problem. That's right. Yeah. Uh, firefighters again had to improvise, which they did by uh, strapping a lower capacity fire hose to the cage of aerial appliance uh, to produce a jet which could uh, reach the tower. Is that a fair summary of what was attempted on the night? That's right. Again, apologies for using the garden hose uh, analogy, uh, but that's equivalent to pinching the opening of the hose with your thumb to produce the longer but necessarily narrower stream of water. Correct. Having identified those consequences, can we now turn to the uh, topic of the causes? And uh, for that purpose, can we stay in chapter five, but go to page 238? And in particular, could we look at paragraph six? And here you provide a neat summary of the causes for us. And you said this, the reasons for the low flow rate extracted from the hydrants at Grenfell Tower include a, the low flow discharge coefficient of the used hydrants. B, in the case of alpha 245 ALP and Sierra 13 alpha 1 ALP, the use of a washout hydrant, H5, which was wrongly labeled fire hydrant. A washout hydrant is not designed for the supply of water for firefighting. C, lack of coordination between LFB and TWUL this also included the continued pressure reduction in the water distribution system by uh, TWUL. D, pressure losses between the hydrants and the pump appliances. Now, what I'd like to do, Dr. Storinoff, is go through each of those causes with you. And first of all, can we deal with the hydrants' low flow coefficients, which will necessarily bring in uh, a question of interpretation of the relevant British standard? Now, if we can go to ISTRP quadruple zero, treble zero eight, forward slash seven two. Now, at lines 19 to 20, at page 72, you explain uh, that the low, sorry, that the flow coefficient of a hydrant is a measure of the flow rate the hydrant can provide in relation to the pressure at that point in a distribution network, close quotes. Now, in layman's terms, is the flow coefficient essentially a measure of how efficient the hydrant is in that it measures how good a flow rate the hydrant can supply given the pressure of the water the hydrant receives from the network? Correct. So the higher the flow coefficient of a hydrant, the better. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you scroll up that page, um, we can, it's um, no more than GCSE maths here, but if you scroll up that page, you would very much see the, uh, the flow discharge equation from an orifice. And, and clearly, if that coefficient is higher, uh, so this is equation 6.2, for example, um, uh, this is the actual calculation of the flow coefficient, but equally... Dr. Stonoff, I don't think we need to go into, okay. to, possibly to save my blushes about GCSE maths, but just okay. for the, conveying the essential <laughs> of the consequence we need here. Um, That's fine. I think, I think we agree. I shall follow your advice. Um, your report sometimes refers to the flow discharge coefficient of hydrants. Um, is that because the terms flow coefficient and discharge coefficient are both used and are interchangeable, at least in this context. That's right. Now, your report distinguishes between the flow coefficient of a standalone hydrant, and I'd like to emphasize that word standalone, and the composite flow efficient of a hydrant. In lay terms, can you explain for us the difference between the two? So the difference between the two is that um, one is, uh, the, uh, if one looks uh, at the flow coefficient of discharge of a hydrant, uh, one could imagine that this just correlates to the hydrant in isolation. So in other words, I can take a hydrant, put it on a pipe rig at Imperial, and I can test this hydrant and look at specific 
flow coefficient or discharge characteristics of that fire hydrant. Now, if I take this fire hydrant and install it in an operational network, the connecting pipeline or the connecting piping around that hydrant might significantly <coughs> differ than this kind of ideal piping arrangements under which I've tested that particular fire hydrant. And that becomes very important in, in urban environment where, you know, when you dig a street to install a fire hydrant, there is a whole set of different infrastructure. And in order to avoid that infrastructure, and I've shown pictures of actually excavation of hydrants in London, you might have a number of elbows, different connecting pipe, and etc. So suddenly, that hydrant which performed extremely well in my lab, when I actually put it in real operational conditions because of the connecting pipe work, might have very different performance characteristics as a whole. And ultimately, that impacts the outcome of how much flow I can discharge. So, so that's why I sort of make that difference between uh, the kind of almost standalone hydrant versus that sort of a composite flow coefficient. So composite flow coefficient is the flow coefficient of an installed hydrant, including the pipes and bends which connect that hydrant to the rest of the network. Correct. Whereas a standalone coefficient is just that, the clues in the title. The flow coefficient of only the hydrant tested in factory settings without the connecting pipe work. So, in general, yes, but again, as we saw in my response, even the testing of this hydrant under any forms of standard includes a small section of connecting <coughs> pipe work, and they are explicitly taken into account. So we're not just testing the, the, the hydrant as a hydrant. The test, even according to British standards, they include certain connecting pipe work, and that's very explicitly described. Can we say that a hydrant's composite coefficient is likely to be lower than its standalone coefficient due to inevitable pressure losses introduced by pipes and bends connecting the hydrant to the rest of the network. Correct. It will be equal or less. Then. Now, you touched in um, your answer, and I touched in the introduction to uh, British Standard 750 at 2012, which is entitled Specification for Underground Fire Hydrants and Surface Box Frames and Covers. Um, we find that standard at BSI uh, quadruple zero one seven six seven. Can we go to paragraph 10.2, which is on page 13, one three? And we'll see here, under the subheading hydraulic characteristics, paragraph 10.2 stipulates that, and I quote, when fitted with a standard round thread outlet, the fire hydrant shall have a KV value of not less than 92. Now, the reference to KV value here is shorthand for, for flow coefficient. Is that right? Correct. Now, you say in chapter four of your report, and it might be useful to go to it, ISTRP quadruple zero, trouble zero five, forward slash 19. Thank you. If we could look at line nine, bearing in mind that KV value, you said this, it is not entirely clear whether the 92 units flow coefficient requirement in BS 750 2012 refers to the hydrant as a standalone valve or when installed in a water distribution network. In other words, it is not entirely clear whether the 92 requirement relates to the standalone flow coefficient or the composite flow coefficient of a hydrant. Um, is that uh, the essential query you're raising here? Correct. And you go on to say that your view is that it refers to the composite flow coefficient. Is that right? That's right. Now, if we can just look at the British standard, um, because it's a, a topic which you considered in your supplemental report, um, can we go to that report, ISTRPS, quadruple zero, treble zero, one, forward slash, six. And if we look at paragraph 17, you set out here your belief that the 92 requirement in the standard 
refers to the installed hydrant with connecting pipework, in other words, to the composite flow coefficient um, for four reasons. And you go through these reasons at length over the, uh, the next 15 pages. We, I don't want to go through those uh, points in detail, but could I summarize them and see whether you agree that I've summarized them correctly? The four reasons you rely upon for your interpretation of the standard are these. First, it follows an integral principle in <coughs> systems engineering, i.e. that in engineering you are less concerned with individual performance of an isolated part of a system, and you are more concerned with the performance of the system as a whole. Is that a fair summary of that reason? Yes, it is. Secondly, you refer to BSEN 60534-2-1, uh, which is a related standard which describes that the process of testing and certifying the, the flow coefficient, that's the KV value of a valve, a hydrant's a valve, um, includes the connected pipe work. Is that the second reason you rely upon for your interpretation? Correct. Thirdly, you note that evidence from relevant stakeholders suggests a common understanding that the KV requirement of 92 refers to an installed hydrant and connecting pipework. Again, is that a fair summary of the third reason you rely upon? That's right, because a lot of these stakeholders, they refer to a particular pressure and particular flow rate for a hydrant on the basis of which we can then refer back to that value of 92. And finally, um, you refer to the absence of a meaningful standard if an alternative view is taken. Again, have I summarized at least the essence of that correctly? Th that's true, because if we don't have that understanding of the composite values, and that needs to be interpreted by uh, a professionally, uh, a, someone, a professional who understands these pitfalls and the ambiguity of the standard, then we have no alternative. I can, I can connect that hydrant with a garden hose, using your example, and I would still pass all the bridge standards. Now, can I examine your reasoning in more detail of, of, of that latter, that fourth point? And it's something you set out in detail at page 15 of your supplemental report. And if we could go to that. Uh, in essence, uh, what you say is that if the 92 requirement refers to a standalone hydrant in factory conditions, there would be no standard or requirement governing the performance of an installed hydrant and hydrants could therefore be installed very poorly without breaching any relevant standards. I put that crudely, but is that the essence of what you're saying? Yes, it is. Now, your supplemental report acknowledges factors which uh, may be read as pointing in the opposite direction and for an alternative interpretation of the standard. And to this end, can we go to turn over the page to page 16 and look at paragraphs 38 and 39? Dr. Steinhoff, it's probably easier if I read these out. Paragraph 38 reads thus. I have described above my reasons for adopting what, in my judgment, appears to be the most appropriate interpretation of the requirement that it relates to an installed hydrant with connecting pipework in a water distribution network. I've also explained that the alternative standalone manufacturing only interpretation would lead to a surprising absence of legal requirements relating to the installation and real-world efficiency of hydrants. Paragraph 39. However, given the ambiguity in the wording of BS 750, I cannot go so far as to say that the standalone interpretation is a wholly unreasonable interpretation of BS 750. Elements of the wording of BS 750 may be taken to lend some support to that interpretation. The scope section of BS 750 states that this British standard applies to underground fire hydrants to be installed in a water supply system. Following the description of the K value requirement of 92, BS 750 adds the K value, KV value of the fire hydrant shall be specified in the manufacturer's literature. And there are a number of other references to the manufacturer. These references may be taken to mean that the standard applies to standalone hydrants in manufacturing or factory conditions. Now, bearing in mind what you say there, would you also agree that the absence of a minimum standard relating to a hydrant's flow coefficient, which would exist if the standalone interpretation of BS750 is adopted, 
while perhaps unsatisfactory, does not mean that we should read British Standard 750 in such a way to bridge that gap. Uh, I, I agree. I, it's, um, yeah. I, if, I, if I look at it scrutinized from very, as you said, legal perspective, yeah, the description is very amb ambiguous. If I look at it from, from the perspective of a hydraulic engineer, I would have sufficient knowledge to recognize that ambiguity and take it into account. Looking at what you say in paragraph 39, and where you say that the standalone interpretation um, is not a wholly unreasonable interpretation of that standard, could we look at it slightly differently, ignore the double negative, and accept that the standalone interpretation is a reasonable one, albeit one with which you don't agree? It, well, as I said, if, I, if I'm not technically competent, I would find this as a reasonable explanation. Thank you. Can we now look at a separate uh, topic, which is the flow coefficients of the hydrants at Grenfell Tower? And as a part of your investigation into the water supply to the tower, you carried out testing in July and September 2018, which enabled you to calculate the composite flow coefficients of some of the hydrants at the tower, including those that were used to supply firefighting efforts on the night. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, we can see the detailed results of those calculations um, at ISTRP quadruple zero, treble zero, eight, forward slash, one, double zero. And if that table could be slightly expanded, Hydrant H1 had a flow coefficient of 74, is that right? Correct. H3 had a flow coefficient of 50, is that right? Correct. Washout hydrant H5 had a flow coefficient of 31, is that right? Correct. And hydrant H8 had a flow coefficient of 50, is that correct? Correct. Now, if your preferred interpretation of BS 750 is adopted, those hydrants should have a composite flow coefficient of no less than 92, so that each of the four on these figures fell well short of that standard. Would that be right? That's right. However, if the alternative interpretation is adopted, <coughs> that the 92 requirement refers only to the standalone hydrant, is it right to say that you wouldn't be able to conclude from your testing that the hydrants fell short of that standard because you were only able to test their composite flow coefficient. That's right, but the ultimate goal here is to deliver water for firefighting. So, uh, you know, having a coefficient of a hydrant which delivers no water is of no use to anyone. Uh, can we go back to your supplemental report, ISTRPS, quadruple zero, trouble zero, one, forward slash 16. And we can see at paragraph 40, which is the very foot of that page, you say this. And it just flows from the point you've made. Even if the alternative view were adopted, that the KV flow coefficient standard of 92 in BS 750 relates to a standalone hydrant, one would expect the installation of hydrants to be carried out in such a way that the KV, the flow coefficient of the hydrant, installed in the water distribution network remains as close as possible to or exceeds 92 by minimizing any possible performance loss from the installation setup and connected pipe work. Now, mindful of what you've said there, regardless of which interpretation of the British standard um, is preferred, would you have expected the flow coefficients of the hydrants installed at Grenfell to be higher than they turned out to be on the basis of the figures you've identified? This is correct because, again, that has an implication on the flow rate which can be delivered to the London Fire Brigade to perform their duties. And I think what we would find it helpful to know, and I think this is the thrust of Mr. Clear's question, is um, if we look at the figures we've got in the table we had up a little earlier, are they, in your experience, typical? Uh, 
Well, it, it's um, so. Let, let me step take a step back. The only way we can identify whether it's a typical or not by doing flow test of hydrants, yeah. and flow test of hydrants are not carried out by the water utilities or by the London Fire Brigade. I would like to refer to a paper which was published a year before um, Grenfell Tower fire, which was by a, a firefighter in, in southwest London. He did carry out something along the lines of 600 tests of fire, flow tests of fire hydrants in southwest London. And his conclusion was that about 20% of these tests almost were inoperable and a very large percentage, almost like over 30%, I believe, based on memory, had flow rates less than 500 liters per minute. So in answer to your question, it seems to be, uh, you know, my sample is not representative out of these five hydrants to draw exact conclusion, although all these results show a much lower values. But if I extrapolate this to the kind of publications of, a, of a, an active firefighter who has go gone and done that test, it seems that this is a very representative uh, sample of what, what's happening in London, that most of these fire hydrants do not have these discharge characteristics which we expect them to have. And is it possible to say whether the discrepancies between the standalone coefficients and the composite coefficients are likely to be due to the, the uh, state of the pipe work? It's the installation conditions of this. And, and because we do not, you know, there's no obligation to flow test these fire hydrants once these are commissioned. We have no information. And the regular testing of these fire hydrants of London Fire Brigade does not include flow testing of these fire hydrants. It's a lottery. We don't know what that discharge correct efficiency and, and characteristics would be until LFB have to deliver the, the required flow rates. Um, one of the things that seems to me to come out of this possibly uh, yeah. relates to the construction of the British standard that you were referring to a moment ago, because um, <clears throat> unless there are factors at work which we're not aware of, if you look at these figures, mm -hmm. it suggests that there can be a difference of almost 50% between the rated Correct. flow rate, so to speak, Correct. and the actual flow rate. Correct. Now, um, I don't know how you can accommodate that within a standard setting document because if the operational conditions can have that degree of influence over uh, performance, then um, how are you going to know whether you've got uh, hydrants which, will, which have a coefficient of 92? You won't. Wouldn't that you? was Unless my you test point. You wouldn't. Unless you test them, you wouldn't know. You've got, but you've got to test all of them in operation because they've got to have the connected pipe work. Correct. And that's one of my points I made in Chapter 4, that a lot of countries around the world, fire rescue services, have this periodic flow test, full flow test of hydrants, because it's not just about the installation conditions, but over a period of time, these things can deteriorate. Yeah. And that's why yeah. this periodic flow test of hydrants becomes extremely important. And as I pointed out in my results, if I know the flow discharge characteristics of fire hydrants, for example, I point out that in France they do them every five years or three years, depend on certain conditions, and I know the hydraulic conditions of the system, I can be very definite in the kind of flow rates the water utility can provide to, uh, to the fire rescue service. But this might in turn have a, an implication for how one reads the British standard. Huge, yes. Uh, because, well, it may be very, it may be more doubtful that the British Standards Institution is setting out to um, prescribe minimum requirements which themselves are dependent on operating conditions. Do you see what I mean? This is where, I, I, in my response, I try to track back the kind of where these values are coming from. And, and, and if you start seeing these kind of variations of British standards, I think the overall meaning was lost. Mm. So clearly we need to define that that component has certain specifications, but that we also need to recognize that that component, as part of the whole system, needs to preserve these specifications because ultimately a firefighter expects, let's say, 2,000 yeah. litres per minute to come out of fire hydrant in London. And that's the ultimate goal we need no, to see. deliver. 
And of course, if I mean the British standard refers to the flow rate being stated by the manufacturer. Um, now, the manufacturer cannot possibly state a flow rate which is dependent on operational circumstances, well, can he? No, he can't, but uh, that's why I was kind of going back to the notion of performance of components. Yeah. So that's uh, a very much component performance. But then the person who puts that component into the system oh, yeah. needs to be qualified and technically uh, knowledgeable to recognize the pitfalls what might happen with that particular component. Yeah. And that's why ultimately we also need to have this flow test. So once that hydrant is installed and commissioned, we really need to understand what actually happened out there. Because there's all, all sorts of other human factors. I mean, a lot of these installations are done by subcontractors, probably with yeah. very low level of supervision. And I've seen uh, many examples of horrendous installations in that respect. Well, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've been responsible for a bit of a digression there. But no, thank you. No, it's useful. Thank you, sir. Um, can I now turn to another reason for the uh, low flow rate, which was the use of a washout hydrant? It's a topic we've touched upon earlier, but I'd like now to turn to it in more detail. And to this end, can we go to um, ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero six forward slash two three eight and paragraph six? This is what we looked at slightly earlier, but just to sort of reorientate yourself in your report. Um, the second reason you identified for low flow rates was, and I quote, in the case of Alpha 245 ALP and Sierra 13 Alpha 1 ALP, the use of a washout hydrant, H5, which was wrongly labeled fire hydrant, a washout hydrant is not designed for the supply of water for firefighting. Um, if we can stay in this, uh, or rather go to chapter six of your report, which we find at AISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero eight forward slash seven nine, uh, we find at the beginning of line 10 um, a, a sort of more detailed explanation of a washout hydrant and its differences uh, uh, from a fire hydrant. And you say this. H5 is a washout hydrant, which is, a, which is different from a fire hydrant. As explained in Chapter 4, washout hydrants are used for operational and maintenance purposes and enable water companies to flush sediments and stagnant water from specific locations. The flushing is generally done at flow rates significantly lower than the flow rates expected from fire hydrants for firefighting. Washout hydrants are not aimed and installed to supply water for firefighting. Washout hydrants look identical to fire hydrants and should be clearly marked, e.g. with a W, uh, to distinguish them. Now, although they have a different purpose to fire hydrants, a washout hydrant may be structurally the same as a fire hydrant and connected to the water network in exactly the same way as a fire hydrant. Is that right? Correct. Um, if we go uh, to the uh, table at page 100 of chapter 6, which we find at ISTRP uh, quadruple zero trouble zero eight forward slash 100, Thank you. Uh, we see, if we look for H5, which is at uh, column 5, and we can see that it has the lowest composite flow efficient of all the hydrants you tested. Uh, that's presumably something you'd have expected due to its different function and design. Correct. And I, I've demonstrated a photograph which shows the installation of hydrants and washout hydrants, and we can visually observe the different pipework associated with that. that. So, um, are you looking for the photograph? Uh, yes, so I, I don't have the document in front of me, so I, my I memories. I don't <laughs> have the reference. I can turn expectantly to someone behind me. I don't have that reference immediately to mind. But okay. if we can just sort of, um, maybe just move on with some text before we find that photograph. If we can go back to um, page 79 of chapter 6, which is at ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero eight forward slash seven nine. 
And if we can see in the next paragraph from line 16 onwards, um, you say this. Um, Washout H5 is owned by uh, Thames Water, and it was installed in February 2014. As I detail in Chapter 5, Washout Hydrant H5 was mistakenly labelled FH Fire Hydrant on the metal lid of the hydrant chamber. Firefighters would not have known that they were connecting a pump appliance to a washout hydrant on the 14th of June 2017. However, the digital maps of the TWUL's network service technicians um, had the information that washout hydrant H5 is a washout hydrant. Now, having been mislabeled FH, and as washout hydrants and fire hydrants otherwise look identical, uh, was there any way for firefighters to identify that H5 was a washout, not a fire hydrant? Not really. Um, it's, um, I mean, th there was a number of factors which were identified through the witness statements. First of all, the um, um, mobile data terminal of the pump appliance in close proximity was not working. Uh, secondly, uh, we have witness statements which demonstrated they tried to uh, attach a, a standpipe to one of the nearby fire hydrants, which I've also identified was inoperable. And then probably in the night, my, my assumption is that they just stumbled across this additional hydrant, which was labeled fire hydrant. So in, in the urge of the situation, it would be extremely difficult, I would imagine, is to extensively test that this was actually not a fire hydrant, but a washout hydrant. Which wasn't practical. It was not practical, that's right. Going back to your earlier request, if we can stay in this chapter and go forward to page 81. This is a uh, series of photographs of H5, the washout hydrant. Was this what you had in mind? Uh, correct. I mean, that uh, during my experimental tests, I noticed that uh, um, the we sort of went through all the kind of hydrants in the area. And I noticed that uh, clearly from the evidence that this was the hydrant used by uh, London Fire Brigade on the 14th of June. Uh, and uh, I noticed that that was labeled fire hydrant, while my records in the in the GIS provided by Thames Water that was labelled as a washout hydrant. And the other impact of that is that clearly LFB would not have been doing any test on that fire hydrant, even the very basic mechanical test they were doing. Uh, uh, that sort of brings me to the other hypothesis, that is we know that uh, um, London Fire Brigade had problems opening that fire hydrant, f that hydrant fully, and the network service technicians opened that hydrant fully at about 5.30. And even then, the flow rate was very low. So my interpretation of that is because of these mishaps of labeling that hydrant, it, it was not just the issue of the, the, the flow rate, but also was the issue that there were certain mechanical potential issues with the stamp of that particular hydrant. Thank you. Now, we're going and, to- And sorry, just to kind of apologize, just to add up, so I, I I kind of notify, because Thames Water was on site, they were overseeing my work and, uh, over and, and shadowing my work. I've notified them that this should be a washout hydrant, and it seems shortly afterwards that was replaced with a W plate. Mm. Thank you. We're going to come on later um, to the, uh, the involvement of Thames Water. Sure. Um, but could I turn to um, uh, a further reason for at low flow rate, and that was pressure losses uh, between the hydrants and the uh, pump appliances. Um, if I can just start off with something basic so we know what we're talking about here. Are you referring to pressure losses caused by friction in the hoses used to transport water from the hydrant to the pump appliance? That's right. Now, is it right that some degree of pressure loss is inevitable? Uh, but that this can be exacerbated by longer hose distances and by bends and kinks in the hoses themselves. Correct. Uh, to what extent uh, did the long distance between some of the hydrants and the tower add to pressure loss on the night of the fire? Are you well, able to answer that scientifically, if I can put it that way? Uh, okay, I mean, it's clearly, as you said, th there is a length of hose which uh, it, it certainly impacts the, the pressure head losses into that system, and therefore it's extremely important to, to set up like um, a tandem of pumping. In other words, you're boosting your pressure. You have one appliance very close to the source of water, to the hydrant, which then pumps to another appliance. And that was done on the northwest side, but it wasn't done on 
uh, on the east side, uh, on, the, on the hydrant H3, which was on Grenfell Road and Bomo Road, uh, until very late into the incident. And that had a significant impact. I mean, uh, the, the empirical evidence for us is that this probably, for that particular, uh, uh, had an impact of probably another two, 300 uh, uh, liters per minute flow rate into the pump appliance. Now, um, we can see, just to give a bit of a practical example, um, if we turn to Chapter 5 of your report, which we can find at ISTRP quadruple zero, trouble zero six forward slash 21. Uh, we can see at uh, line 7 onwards uh, a section describing the deployment of the Grand Monitor on Grenfell Walk. And if we turn over the page to page 22, and beginning at line 17, um, you say this. Now, what I'm thinking is a practical illustration of the point you've just made. But what your report says is this. As with alpha 213 TL, this low flow rate was because of the flow discharge characteristics of the fire hydrant and the long length, about 115 meters, of fire hoses between fire hydrant H3 and pump Golf 272. The pressure losses in the long length of fire hoses between fire hydrant H3 and pump Golf 272 reduced the flow into the tank of pump Golf 272 by around 20% of the available flow rate from fire hydrant H3. Consequently, the setup of a pump relay between fire hydrant H3 and pump Golf 272 at around 0, 0600 hours increase the flow rate in the tank of pump Golf 272 from about 1,200 litres per minute, that's 20 litres per second, to approximately 1,500 litres per minute, 25 litres per second, or about 86% of the Grand Monitor's rated flow rate of 1,750 litres per minute, or 29 litres per second. Now, there's a lot of uh, technical detail in that quote, but is the key point that the long length of hose needed to correct the hydrant to the pump appliance over 100 metres away had the effect of reducing the flow rate by about 20% or so? Correct. And you also note in this paragraph that at about uh, 0,600 hours, the LFB was able to mitigate these losses by setting up a pump relay. Um, first of all, what is a pump relay? It's a way to boost the pressure within that sort of um, a system of delivering the water for firefighting. So pump relay will be, uh, you have multiple pumps which might be, uh, for example, in series or parallel, depending whether you want to boost your pressure or flow rate in that particular case. Uh, uh, so if I want to boost my pressure to negate the impact of these pressure head losses, it will be setting up this operation of pumps in series. So you have the first pump pumping into that particular case in the reservoir of the second pump, and that guarantees a higher flow rate into the second pump to then deliver the pump discharge pressure. So it's a boost between the hydrant and the primary pump appliance. That's right. Now, the first three reasons uh, you identified for the low flow rates um, relate to low flow rates extracted from hydrants whereas this fourth one relates to losses in pressure between hydrants and pump appliances. Correct. That's a fair summary, isn't it, I think? Correct. Is it a fair summary of your analysis to say that uh, while these losses between the hydrants and pump appliances were also a significant factor, the principal cause of the low flow rates was the low flow rates extracted from hydrants? That's right. Thank you. I'd now like to move away uh, from some of these technical matters and to look at the role of Thames water itself. Now, chapter seven of your report gives a detailed chronology of the actions taken by Thames water and its employees throughout the incident, uh, including communications and other interactions uh, between Thames water and the LFB. Is that a fair summary of chapter seven? Correct. Uh, that uh, chapter was based on your review of evidence, including statements and documents provided to the inquiry by Thames Water and the LFB, and transcripts of calls between Thames Water and LFB personnel. Is that right? Correct. Now, the LFB first made contact with Thames Water by telephone at 0128. Is that right? That's right. And uh, we can see an extract of the transcript of that particular call 
um, at ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero nine forward slash nine. And we can see at line seven to ten of the table in the top half of that page that the LFB made a request for a water technician to attend and for Thames water remotely to increase the pressure. Is that a fair summary? That's right. And if we uh, stay in this chapter, but turn to page 95, uh, we can see at paragraph 25 that uh, before 11 a.m., Thames Water deployed a total of six network service technicians, NSTs, to attend the instant ground at Grenfell. Uh, is that a fair summary? That's right. And you refer to the first two as NST1L and NST2D, D for Delta, who arrived at 0215 hours, NST4N, N for November, and NST3A, who arrived later at about 0415, and finally NST5M for Mother, and NST6R, who arrived at about 0730 hours. Is that right? That's right. Now, can I uh, next turn to control interventions um, affected by Thames Water. And if we can stay in this chapter, but go to page 85, and in particular section 7.8.1 of your report. Now you say in subparagraph one that Thames Water carried out two control <coughs> interventions uh, on the night. Um, first of all, so we understand basic terms, what is your understanding of a control intervention? This is a very broad term, um, but in that particular case means the opening of a valve, and these are specifically manually operated gate valves. Now, you identify two control interventions. First of all, the opening of district boundary valve DBV214263 which connected pressure-reduced area PBARHT08 with a neighbouring <coughs> pressure-reduced area PBARHT07 through a 100 millimetre pipe at about 0309 hours. And the second intervention was, and I quote, the opening of district boundary valve DBV214521 which provided an additional hydraulic connection within pressure reduced area PBAR HT08 through a 100 millimeter pipe at 11.05 hours. Now, a district boundary valve is a valve which connects two different areas of the water network. Essentially, is that correct? This is correct. And I, I think it would be really helpful if we can bring some of the schematics I have in, in Chapter 6. If we can uh, take it... really visualise this. I think if we just take it stage by stage, Dr. Stoyanov, for these purposes. Now, is the rationale for opening boundary valves between different areas to increase the pressure and or reduce the energy losses in the target area by connecting it to another part of the water network, which has its own inlet from water sources, thereby spreading pressure losses uh, more broadly across a larger area? Uh, that's the intuition, but this is just an intuition. In, in reality, uh, that decision cannot be made just by eyeballing a valve and making that decision. That decision needs to be made based on a more rigorous hydraulic analysis on the operation of the network. Now, it's really flowing from that point. If we can take things again stage by stage, can we go Stay on this page, page 85, and look at line 22. And you say this. The hydraulic analysis carried out in chapter six indicates that the opening of the two district boundary valves by TWUL had minimal, no material impact on increasing the pressure at washout hydrant location H5. And consequently, the opening of the two district boundary valves had minimal, no material impact on increasing the flow rate from washout hydrant H5 into the onboard tanks of the connected pump appliances, namely pump alpha 241 and later in the instant uh, pump Sierra 13 uh, uh, Polo 1. 
Both of these interventions by TWUL were made in response to requests by LFB for an increase in the flow rate from washout hydrant H5. The same conclusion can be extended to all four hydrants used by LFB to provide water for fighting the fire, namely that the interventions by TWUL, e.g. the opening of the two boundary valves by TWUL, had minimal, no material impact on increasing the flow rates from the four hydrants used by LFB into the onboard tanks of the connected uh, pump appliances. Now, in layman's terms, um, you conclude that Thames Water's actions on the 14th of June resulted in no material improvement in the water supply provided to the LFB's firefighting equipment. As a lay summary, would you accept that? I do. And that is based on the analysis you carried out using the mathematical model of the water distribution network, which we discussed earlier in your evidence. That's right. Now, can we look at other actions taken by Thames Water, and in particular the actions taken by the network service technicians? I'm going to call them NSTs. That's right. Now, if we can uh, turn over the page to go to page 86 of your report, and if we could look at paragraph 4 which is at the head of that page. There you describe two further actions taken by the NSTs during the incident. A, between approximately 06 hours and 06.30 hours, four NSTs assisted with cleaning drains which were causing flooding around Grenfell Tower and preventing LFB firefighters from gaining safe access to the building. And B, at approximately 06.30, NST 4N, N for November, fully operated a hydrant in use by LFB, most likely washout hydrant H5, <coughs> after noticing it had only been opened half a turn. This action increased the flow rate from around 380 litres per minute, the flow rate reported by watch manager Beale, to a flow rate of 450 litres per minute uh, to 500 litres uh, per minute, the flow rate reported by station uh, manager Payton. Now, again, in lay terms, does that mean that the washout hydrant was like a half-open tap with a reduced amount of water coming out of it before the NST noticed it and fully opened it? Uh, correct, and I refer to my previous comment, is because that hydrant was not inspected by LFB, was not what we called exercised, etc. Most likely the stem of that valve uh, couldn't, couldn't operate fully, uh, might have jammed at that point, and that was noticed later by the network service technicians would open it a little bit more. Nevertheless, the total flow coefficient of this hydrant remains very low. Mm. Now, uh, given your conclusion um, about the minimal impact of opening the boundary uh, valves, is it right to say that this action by NST 4N was likely the most effective intervention by Thames Water, in your view, uh, during the instant in terms of increasing the flow rate? Um, I, I mean, this is where I, I really struggle to, to drive a conclusion without referring back to the hydraulic model. Uh, you know, these are actions taken by the network service technicians without understanding the hydraulics of the system. And that's, that's not something we expect from them to know in great detail. That's the kind of the role of the network management center. And we've seen from these examples that they received no feedback and guidance from the network management center to run these what-if scenarios and, and provide a competent engineering knowledge of these control actions. So in the end of the day, the control action was pure improvisation on, on on behalf of this network service technician uh, to the best of his knowledge, but that improvisation was, uh, had no impact. And secondly, um, he would have no knowledge to, to judge what impact that would have had. Can we leave that topic okay. and come on to a separate one, which is the communications between LFB and Thames Water. It's linked to the points um, you've made. Now, I put this broadly, in chapter seven, you criticize the uh, quality and substance of the communication between the LFB and Thames Water. Um, the summary of your point can possibly be most usefully found at page 93 in this chapter. And 
And if we look at paragraph 21, uh, you say this, and forgive me for reading it out, but it's possibly quite useful to bearing in mind what you've said. Communication between t LFB and TWL's NSTs occurred on an ad hoc basis, and consequently, the communication was qualitative, imprecise, and lacked technical rigor. LFB control instant command did not articulate, quantify, and communicate their water supply and flow rate needs to the TWL's NMC, so that's Network Management Center that you referred exactly. to earlier. Such quantitative requests could have included A, a clear statement about the required flow rate for a particular appliance, e.g. the aerial appliance at the east side requires a flow rate of uh, 2,400 litres per minute, 40 litres per second. How can this be achieved? And then if we can uh, turn over the page, looking at little, the first little b at the top of that page, you say LFB requests could also include the following. Periodic updates by the LFB control <clears throat> to TWUL's network management center as the mobilization of appliances with significant water flow requirements progressed. Such updates could have included the required water flow rate on the instant ground, e.g. LFB requires X liters per minute in this area. And this includes an aerial appliance on the east side of Grenfell Tower 2,400 litres per minute, a ground monitor on the south side, about 1,900 limited litres per minute, a water supply to the dry fire main between about 1,600 to 2,000 litres per minute. These are the approximate locations of the mobilised appliances and equipment. Can this flow rate be achieved and how? Paragraph 22. Furthermore, <coughs> excuse me, TWL's NSTs do not appear to have requested clear quantitative indications of LFB water supply and flow needs, which, if not forthcoming from LFB, NSTs could have proactively requested themselves. Now, having set that out, um, would you agree that your suggestions here amount to a council of perfection and that you cannot safely comment on whether it was operationally feasible for the brigade or indeed Thames Water to have detailed quantitative discussions given everything that was going on on the fire ground? Uh, I disagree with that assessment. Uh, I mean, we know very well from, for example, Watch Manager Bill and uh, a lot of the statements. First of all, they had very good understanding of the flow requirements for their appliances. Uh, they also knew exactly where they are connected. Certainly, they could describe that. So that information presents an opportunity to really kind of have the kind of dialogue I'm describing there. On the other hand, it's very common. Uh, I mean, I work with many water utilities in England. Uh, uh, their incident management procedures include a hydraulic modeler. Uh, that hydraulic modeler is on standby for that purpose to be able to simulate particular demand conditions on the network and very quickly provide a guidance. Uh, and that guidance is also taken into account fire incidents such as this one. In, in that particular case, I see no examples that any forms of hydraulic modeling has been carried out from these discussions and any consideration of any data available to Thames Water through their telemetry system was taken into account. So, um, so I, don't, uh, I don't agree with that assessment. Pushing it slightly further, obviously you've made a number of observations on the effectiveness uh, and efficiency of the communication and coordination between the, the brigade and uh, TWUL. Now, would you accept that those are largely matters of operational and organisational competence? Uh, for those bodies which don't obviously fall within the scope of your own experience and expertise? Uh, yes, I broadly agree with that statement. Uh, however, we also cannot decouple the kind of the hydraulics what we observe without taking into account some of these human factor interactions. And uh, as, as someone who has worked uh, both in, as an academic and researcher and practitioner, into the water industry in the UK for over 20 years, I find this uh, highly inadequate to have that level of discussion to define key requirements for making incident-based decisions. Uh, but the points you raise are points which you would uh, actively encourage 
both the LFB and Thames Water to uh, consider carefully? I think they are absolutely essential if both of these organizations need to provide safe and secure supply of water for firefighting, yes. Now, can we turn to page 102 um, of this chapter, uh, where you discuss alternative control options that were uh, potentially available to Thames Water on the 14th of June, and you set out four in particular at paragraph 45. Uh, they include the following increasing the pressure in PBARHT08 by switching on the Hammersmith pumps and turning off the pressure reduction control um, uh, for PBARHT08. <coughs> I will call that just 08, um, just for clarity. Increasing the pressure in 08 by turning off the pressure reduction control, for example, bypassing the pressure reducing valves or fully opening these valves. C opening boxed closed inlets such as DM, that's Delta Mother 18631, D, the utilisation of multiple hydrants to provide uh, water for firefighting. Now, could we go through each of those four options briefly uh, in turn? Um, first, you refer to the option of switching on the Hammersmith pumps. Now, just to remind those following, um, we saw earlier that the Hammersmith pumping station was one of the available sources of water um, in the Barrow Hill zone, uh, the water uh, network area in which the tower was uh, was found. Is that right? Th that's correct. Again, I would, it, I would if appreciate just, uh, if we can keep to a, one of these figures because it, it, it can tell fully the picture, what I'm trying to convey. Okay, we just go through, sort of deal with the basics first. Um, now, if we look at paragraph 46 on this page, the normal cycle in June 2017, which was also followed on June on the 14th of June, was that these pumps operated during the day, but were automatically turned off at some point between 0, 0, 0030 hours and 0, 0, 0045 hours, before being automatically turned on again at 0, 0530 hours. Is that right? Correct. Now, in layman's terms, can you help us? Why would turning the Hammersmith pumps back on during that time have increased the water supply to the LFB? Because, again, we are, we are discussing here marginal gains, cumulative gains into the uh, increasing the pressure into the network. And that, as we discussed, might have a small impact on the on the discharge of water into the, into, from the fire hydrants. But nevertheless, we need to put that into the context. If that discharge of additional three, four, five hundred liters per minute on a ground monitor allows us to reach another three floors, that have a, a significant impact on the night. Now, just That's why is the, the reason why I'm trying to raise this issue is that uh, the system continued to be pressure reduced throughout the incident. And in my view, there is absolutely no justification for that pressure reduction to continue during that particular incident. Bear in mind your reference in answer there to marginal gains. Yes. Are you able to say how significant a difference turning on the Hammersmith pumps would have made to the flow rates delivered from the four hydrants to the firefighting equipment? I would, uh, I would be able to, uh, based on the figures which I present, to demonstrate what the pressure at the inlet to these pressure-managed areas is and would be. That certainly I can do that. And equally, by turning off the pressure reduction uh, system in place, we can quantify how much extra pressure there will be at these particular hydrants. And then, with regards to the impact of pressure in discharge, I would be able to tell you how much additional flow rate we can get from these hydrants by doing that particular control intervention. Bearing in mind your reference to marginal gains, can we look at matters adjectively? Is it fair to say that any increase would have been modest at best? That's right. Um, that's a fair assessment. It would be modest, but another uh, 10 meter of pressure head would have increased, as I said, again, the flow rate with the current, with the, with the existing use of hydrants, but another two, three um, liters per minute. And again, if that means that marginal gain refers to another two or three floors, of impeding the spread of fire, to me that was the price worth paying. Can we look at the second option you refer to in paragraph 45 on page 102? And that was switching off the pressure reduction in control, uh, pressure reduction control which was in place at the time. 
Now, if I can just deal with some basic propositions first, Dr. Stoyanov. First of all, the tower was situated within a pressure managed area, is that right? Uh, that's right. They are normally. If we, if we just take it that's right. Say, that's, that's right. Good. Secondly, a pressure managed area is an area of the water network in which water companies reduce the water pressure to reduce the risk of water leaks and pipe bursts. Is that right? Uh, they don't reduce the risk, they reduce the leaks because it's again orifice discharge. Thank you. And if we could go to ISTRP quadruple zero treble zero eight forward slash two three one. Uh, we can see at the end of line 11, going through to line 13, you concluded that the pressure reduction scheme in operation during the Grenfell Tower fire resulted in a reduction of pressure of between 7 to 13 metres, or put differently, 0.7 to 1.3 bar throughout the incident. Is that correct? Correct. Um, is that the basis for your conclusion, um, which we touched on earlier? Uh, that one of the reasons for the low flow rate extracted from hydrants was, quotes, the continued pressure reduction in the water distribution system by Thames Water. Correct, but uh, again, this is the marginal gains. That was relatively, you know, if, even that sort of 1.3 bar has a, a small impact, but then if you take a small impact from the pressure reduction plus small impact increasing the pumps and et cetera, that marginal gain suddenly becomes... More, more tangible and more beneficial for the fire brigade, particularly in a situation when you're trying to really maximize both your equipment, resources, outreach, etc. cetera. Uh, I think you've impliedly given the answer to this question, but I'll answer, ask it explicitly to uh, get the benefit of your evidence. Does it follow that turning off the pressure reduction control during the incident would have resulted in a corresponding increase of uh, 7 to 13 meters or 0.7 to 1.3 bar in pressure? That's my estimate, yes. Again, you've been very fair in saying we're looking here at marginal increases. Again, would that increase uh, in pressure have been at the modest end of the spectrum? Th that's right. Uh, but um, you have to take that into, into two particular directions. One of them is the use of the hydrants is used by London Fire Brigade. And the other one, I said, demonstrate it if London Fire Brigade, with the guidance of Thames Water, was started using multiple hydrants, that would have had much bigger impact. Now, in relation to each of these two options we've been discussing, um, turning on Hammersith pumps and turning off the pressure reduction control, you observed in your report that Thames Water did not uh, follow those options because of concerns that the resulting increase in pressure could lead to pipe bursts. Um, we don't need to go to it, but it's a ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero nine four slash one oh one. Now, if we can go and look at that. May I just say that there were two if, conflicting if we can wait, statements. If, if we can just wait rather than, wait for the question okay. rather than giving the answer to a question that hasn't yet been asked. Can we go to ISTRP quadruple zero trouble zero nine forward slash one zero six? And if we could look at section 7.8.7, 7, uh, which, as you'll see, is under the emboldened headline, the risk of pipe breaks from turning on the Hammersmith pumps and or turning off the pressure reduction control. Uh, you conclude, if we look at uh, line 7, there was a minimal risk of pipe breaks from turning the pumps on at Hammersmith pumping station and turning off the pressure reduction control in 08. This is the pressure uh, managed, and so 08, that's the pressure managed area in which Grenfell Tower is found, is that right? That's right. Yeah, sorry, that's the point I should have put to you earlier. Um, just so we absolutely clear about terms that have been used here, pipe breaks and pipe bursts are synonymous terms, aren't they? They're describing the same thing. Yes, they are. Now, your reasoning to support this conclusion is found in the next paragraph. And essentially, to summarize the position, and please disagree if I've not done this fairly or completely, A, the pipes have been in place for a number of years before the pressure reduction areas were introduced. 
meaning they already had a track rec record of operating successfully without pressure reduction. Secondly, that the increased pressure would still have been within the rated or recommended levels for those pipes, 82% of which were relatively new. Have I fairly summarised your reasons for the conclusion uh, which we've just looked at? That's right. I mean, the network is was fairly new. It was part of the uh, Victorian um, renovation mains program. Thames Water has been running for a while, uh, and that's very unique. Uh, in a way, we had um, we had pipes, uh, high density polyethylene, uh, polyethylene pipes with age less than ten years. So they, they were certainly uh, within the very much the pressure rating was within the pressure operating there. But the other thing is that the pressure managed scheme was only implemented in April 2017, or two months before the actual incident. So uh, if, if the pipes have been operated under these conditions for a good eight, 10 years, there's no reason suddenly to believe that by turning back to the, to the pressure management conditions which were in place just two months ago, suddenly will increase the, the risk of pipe failures. Now, bearing that in mind, would you agree that increased pressure in the, neck, in the network that would have resulted from turning on the Hammersmith pumps or turning off the pressure reduction control would have increased the stress experienced by pipes in the network, which brought a risk, even if small, of causing a burst in the more vulnerable parts of the network, which had older, unreplaced pipes? Again, I'm just referring that uh, clearly these pipes were subjected to this kind of uh, stress just two months before the, the fire. And, and the other things you have to bear in mind that uh, one phenomenon which haven't accounted for is during the pumping, the operation of these pumps, as we discussed, they were continuously on and off. That sudden discharge was creating a huge level of pressure transients into the system itself. So, so as a result of that, we, these pipes had already been subjected to quite a lot of stress. And, and my engineering judgment, having dealt with a lot of pipe failures, is that would be that the risk is actually minimal to, to go back to a, a pressure management scheme which was in place just two months ago. Just bearing in mind the question that you were asked, um, would you accept that the increased pressure from turning on Hammersmith pumps, turning off pressure reduction control, would have brought a risk, even if small, of causing a burst in the more vulnerable parts? Could I have an answer to th the question? Uh, yeah, how can we quantify this? Well, I think it was put to you as small. Would you accept that? Yes. Uh, would you agree that a burst in one of the distribution pipes could have led to the loss of substantial volumes of water and wider spread at depressurization of the surrounding network? Yes. And would you agree that such an event occurring on the night of the fire would have put at risk the entire water supply to the tower? Uh, correct. Now, the third alternative in intervention option um, you identified at page 102, and if we could go back to that page, please. Apologies for jumping around, Dr. Steinoff. And you identified there, we can see at line 10, little c, opening boxed closed inlets, uh, such as DM18631. Um, again, a technical term, but is the opening of a boxed closed inlet similar to the opening of a district boundary valve, which we discussed earlier, with the key difference that while the boundary valves opened by Thames Water simply connected the water network at the tower to other areas <coughs> which were also undergoing pressure reduction, and here you refer to the opening of a valve or inlet which would have helped to bypass the pressure reduction. That's right. Yeah. But can I just again point out Please do. that... Uh, in my uh, correspondence with Thames Water and questioning Thames Water, we received two contradictory statements. One of the statements was very clearly identified by Thames Water that uh, pumps could have been turned on and pressure reduction could have been turned off, but the request for that was not received. So it seems that Thames Water contradicts its own assessment post Grenfell that one of the responses, yes, we could have done it, we just didn't get the request. And the second request is second version of events or, or, or explanation was supporting the logbook on the night of the 
fire, which basically says we pursue, uh, perceive a higher risk of pipe burst if we actually implement this control operation in place. So even from a point of view of Thames water, it seems that there is a lot of contradiction. And it's, again, this is an issue which we very difficult for us to assess. I don't think anyone could really assess small risk in that space. No, that's possibly a matter for the panel in due course. Yeah. Now, the final option you refer to in paragraph 45 on page 102 is the utilisation of multiple hydrants to provide water for firefighting. Now, uh, that refers to the use of more than one hydrant to supply a single pump appliance uh, to maximise the flow rate delivered from the network to the pump appliance. Am I right about that? Correct. Would you accept that Thames water staff uh, aren't experts in operational firefighting? Presumably you do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, would you accept that Thames water staff uh, don't have detailed knowledge of the workings and setup of pump appliances and other firefighting equipment? Uh, can I just, again, the caveat is probably not, I would not expect the network service technicians to have that knowledge, but I would expect the network management control centre to actually have that knowledge, or at least have some understanding of how this provision of water for firefighting can be done with the utilisation of multiple hydrants. And when you say some understanding... Um uh, we are, I mean, the request is to extract large volumes of water from your water distribution network, and uh, that's a subject to, a, again, running a hydraulic model with a specific loading condition, and, and it's a very computationally efficient way to do it. One can do it literally within a few minutes. Would you accept, just looking at it slightly differently, that Thames Water are not well placed? Um, to advise a fire and rescue service on what equipment to use, how to deploy it, etc. Uh, I, I <laughs> so yes, and I totally agree with the overall gist of that message. But equally, as an operator, if you get a request for increase in pressure, etc., my engineering kind of training would, would prompt me to ask questions, what exactly do you want, how much do you want, what flow rate do you want, and et cetera. These are very basic engineering questions to ask, to quantify, so that I can assess to what extent my system can respond to that and advise you accordingly. And really, your criticism's focused on asking those basic questions, isn't it, and nothing more than that? That's right. Can I turn now on to a separate um, topic, which is um, an assessment of higher flow rates and whether they could have been achieved. And to this end, can we go to um, ISTRP quadruple zero triple zero eight forward slash 216? And if we can look at line eight, you explain your assessment in the following terms. This assessment investigates whether a higher water flow rate could have been provided from the water distribution network based on the mathematical modelling of pressure and flow in the water distribution network uh, using the validated hydraulic model of the water described in this chapter. The analysis for this assessment includes the formulation of an optimization problem which selects an optimum number of fire hydrants for LFB to connect to in order to deliver target water flow rates from the water distribution network to efficiently, 100%, utilize firefighting appliances and equipment. The formulated optimization problem considers the hydraulic flow and pressure conditions in the water distribution network, the available fire hydrant locations, their discharge characteristics, flow coefficients, together with the control settings of pressure reducing valves, PRVs, at the inlets of the water distribution network as decision variables. Now, the rest of section 6.8 explains in far greater detail um, how you carried out the assessment in broad term, uh, how you carried out the assessment. In broad terms, is it right to say that the assessment used mathematical modeling to calculate whether, given the hydraulic conditions on the night of the fire, there was an optimum combination of hydrants that could have delivered greater flow rates uh, to firefighting equipment? That's right. Now, the results of uh, the assessment are set out at the top of page 226 in this chapter, which I'd be grateful if we could go to. And we can see at the top of the page you uh, say this, uh, starting at line three. 
one, it was possible to achieve a flow rate of 7,460 litres per minute, that's 124 litres per second, without changing the control settings for the pressure reduction scheme on the 14th of June 2017, providing that LFB utilise multiple hydrants, for e.g. fire hydrants 1, 3, 8, 4 and 7. Two, it was possible to achieve a flow rate of 12,000 litres per minute, that's 200 litres per second, by changing the control settings for the pressure reduction scheme on the 14th of June 2017 and providing that LFB utilised multiple hydrants, e.g. fire hydrants 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 11, 13 and 14. Now, taking the step back from that, uh, that uh, seems to show, and please say if this is not a correct summary, that your modelling showed that a total flow, flow rate of 7,400 litres per minute could theoretically have been achieved without turning off the pressure reduction in the network, or alternatively, 12,000 litres per minute if the pressure reduction had been turned off. Is that fair? That's right. And for context, the peak flow rate actually delivered on the 14th of June 2017 was about 4,320 litres per minute. Is that correct? That's right. Could we go to page 218 in this chapter, please? 218. Uh, Mr. Kinnear, can I just ask you, we've got, sorry, on the page we've just left, um, it suggested that the LFB could have used what? 10 hydrants? Yes. That's right. Um, how far away would they be from the uh, site of the fire? Would it be worth looking at the little diagram? I'm, I'm trying to find if I can be given the reference to the map of the area. So, so uh, just for context, clearly here what we've done, we use um, the mathematical model, which simulates the distribution of flow and pressure, yeah. and also the formulation of this optimization problem to say, find given the flow coefficient, we assume that we know the flow coefficient of hydrants, that's why mm -hmm. it's so important. Given the flow coefficient of hydrants, extract that maximum flow rate with a minimum distance to hydrants. So that was the formulation of the optimization problem. Right. But equally, one does not need to run that more sophisticated optimization problem. One can go and just pick up hydrants and say, I'm going to fully open that hydrant, and if I get these things, what impact does it have? Uh, and that's the kind of the importance of having this technical knowledge and analysis available in almost near real time, which I see no reason why Thames Water couldn't have performed that duty. Uh, the other option is what happened on the night where, uh, as I highlight in Chapter 7, there is this complete mismatch of communication. Mm. You, you know, you have a, a, a representative of the London Fire Brigade says, give me more pressure. And at the same time, you have a technician of... Uh, from uh, Thames Water who looks in, in their mindset, pressure in the network, it's, it's pretty good, and they say, we can't deliver anymore. And then the intuition of making the decision on the behalf of the fire rescue services, we can't get any more flow. So let's yeah. just keep whatever we are doing. Could I go All to right. the diagram just before the break, if it would help you, sir? Well, I'd just I'm, be interested to see it, to be honest. Um, could we go to ISTRP quadruple zero, trouble zero six, forward slash six, which should give us figure 5-2. And if that could be expanded. Um, if, if it's more helpful, I have the solution of this specifically with the diagram of hydrants, which were identified into, I don't have the report in front of me, but oh. certainly there was a diagram. Well, it might analysis. be, given the time, sir, if we could see the particular diagram, we can find the diagram to which Dr. Stoinos is referring and maybe draw it up uh, when we return at two. Yes, would that be convenient? Yes. All right, well, Dr. Stolenoff, we'll, we'll look at the diagram, but after lunch. All right, so we'll stop there. We'll uh, resume, please, at uh, two o'clock. And again, while you're out of the room, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything relating to it. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Two o'clock. Thanks, please. Sir.